sure you're doing that yourself. Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education meeting here on Monday, November 8th, 2021 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the District 58, oh, it's actually not, it's on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel. All right, Melissa, we please call roll. Member Joshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick is absent. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over there to my right. As we no longer have limits on in-person attendance, we will not be taking any remote comments. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. All right, as we always do, we're going to go ahead and start with the flag salute. So I'd like to welcome uh, the student council from uh, Highland. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Principal Zach Kraft, welcome. Good evening. It's wonderful to see everybody in person. Yes. Yay. Feels like coming home. As we move towards a more typical school year, even though we're not quite at normal yet, uh, we are really excited to be getting back to some of the things that we have loved and, and missed over the pandemic, both instructionally and culturally, and also excited to put into place some of the lessons that we learned from the pandemic and some of the things that it taught us. So tonight you'll get a, a snippet of our, what our reading and math school improvement plan goals look like in action. You'll hear from our, some of our student council officers so is our P one of our PTA presidents. So, Dr. Wright. Welcome to Highland School. We're excited to share with you some of the things we've been up to this year and talk about our school improvement goals in the areas of reading and math. Our students are excited to be able to work with partners and in small groups once again. Our teachers are grateful to be able to return to proven reading practices this year. Part of our school improvement goal in the area of reading, Highland teachers have implemented the Fontas and Pinnell benchmarking system. This system allows our teachers to gain a better understanding of students' precise reading levels and tailor their instruction to meet the needs of all students at all levels. In our primary grade levels, in addition to our typical reading instruction strategies, our teachers have implemented the Foundations of Literacy program in addition to Michael Haggerty's work in first grade. Now let's hear from two Huskies about what they like most about reading class. What do you like most about reading class? What I like most about reading class is I get to read about nonfiction and I get to read about different stories that I, and it's really fun about reading. Um, so I like most about reading class is guided reading because that's when we get to do our um, must do's and may do's and um, usually I like to um, like read after I finish all of the must do's. In the area of math, our teachers are implementing our new math curricular resources, Bridges and Big Ideas. These new resources not only challenge students to think in new ways, but they also extend student thinking beyond traditional algorithms. Let's hear from some of our students about their favorite parts of math. What do you like most about math class? Well, I like to be challenged and I like to problem solve, and math gives me both. What do you like most about math class? I like how each strategy can make uh, uh, learning math easier and like before these strategies you just have to memorize everything mm -hmm. and the strategies are just much easier to memorize and memorize how each strategy is supposed to be used. Mm -hmm. How does math challenge you to think about math in new ways? Um, so like if I'm like while I get challenged with like new things uh, I'll probably try to figure out a strategy to figure out what I'm getting challenged by it. Like, I'm trying to find a strategy to help me complete that challenge. What conversations do you have in math with your friends? 
Um, we usually talk about on um, how we use our strategies like to solve a different problem and how we get to the problem that we solved, like how we get to the answer of the problem. Mm -hmm. What kind of conversations do you have with your friends during math class? Well, we compare our answers and the strategies that we use to solve the problem and we see how we got the answers and we discuss if we think our, prop, our answers to the question is right and correct. Do you think math is different compared from this year to other years? Um, yes, because the equations are much more difficult and it may take a few more uh, steps to solve the problem in order to get the answer. Really liking math this year? Yeah, it always keeps me interested and it's not just about memorizing, it's about seeing the problem and learning how to solve it the correct way. This year, we held student council elections once again. Our student council does a fantastic job of raising money to help not only those in our community, but also to help improve our school. Let's hear a little bit from student council president Ishan Mehta on why he decided to run for student council president and what he loves most about Highland. Um, the reason I decided to run for student council president is because um, I'm, I don't really like to, I don't really share my ideas as much, but I do have lots of them, so I thought this would be a better opportunity to express them better. Um, what I like about uh, Highland the most is the staff and the students, how they just make everybody feel like you're at home and a really fun environment. We are so thankful that our students got to come back to Highland this year to play at a brand new playground and blacktop area. Thank you to Climb Higher at Highland and all of the volunteers for their tireless work to make this incredible project a reality. Thank you for your continued support and what better way to end tonight than with our Highland School Song. I'm Christine Priester, I'm the assistant principal over at Highland School, and I have the pleasure tonight to introduce our student council officers for this school year. They are excited to share their leadership contributions um, um, that they give to our Highland, uh, Highland community. So first up, we have Ishan Mehta, who is our student council president, Johnny Vlahos, who is our vice president, Abram Roberts, who is our sixth grade secretary, and not with us tonight is Sophia Goronsky, our fifth grade secretary. So I'll turn it over to Ishan. Um, hello, I'm Ishan Mehta, and I'm the president of Highland School Student Council. As you know, to get into the office, you have to run in the Highland Student Council election. The candidates that do not get selected for the office get to be in leadership council, which is also an important role. Student Council is all about making Highland School a better place. One of our goals is to make Highland a fun learning environment. We want everyone to feel that they have a voice here at Highland School. Good evening everyone. My name is Johnny Vlahos and I'm the 5th grade Vice President of Highland School Student Council. One of our favorite things to do at our school is having Spirit Days. Spirit Days are a fun way for students to show off their school spirit. Some spirit days that we have done in the past are Superhero Day, Disney Day, Sports Day, and much more. For days like these, students may show spirit through clothes, headwear, and their actions. Spirit days are planned by the Student Council. We plan to have some new, fun, spirity ideas, such as Couch Potato Day. Everyone wears <laughs> their sweatpants on the spirit day and gets cozy. Principal Day. Everyone just is like our principal, Mr. Kraft. This can make for some funny photos. Summer Day. If summer seems too far away, we can bring a little sun to your school by having everyone dress like it's summer for the day. Lifeguards, tours, campers. These are just a few of the ways we plan to show our spirit at Highland this year.
Hello, my name is Abram Roberts and I'm the sixth grade secretary at Highland Elementary. The student council has hosted various projects to raise money for Highland School in the past. This money goes towards making Highland School a better, a better, more fun environment. In the past, we purchased new water bottle fillers so that students don't have to walk to the other side of this building to fill up water bottles. There are numerous things that we have bought before the pandemic, including a stone bench featuring two f children reading, the reading benches outside the office, a comfy sofa for a library, and many other things. Along with cool spirit days and amazing money makers, we also have some service projects at Highland. Last year, we had three major service projects. We participated in Birthday in a Box, where we collected over 60 bags of party supplies to donate to the Humanitarian Service Project, which services families in DuPage and Kane counties. Their goal is to create wonderful birthday memories for children living in poverty. We also helped support the West, West Suburban Humane Society by collecting kitty litter, dog food, paper towels, and toys for the dogs and cats at the shelter. Lastly, we sponsored our annual giving tree in which we collected items such as clothing and toys for families in need. Service projects help make our community a better place. The people in the community help us, so now it's our turn to help them. Each year, the Student Council gives Highland School a gift. Some wonderful things Student Council has been able to buy for the school is the picnic table outside and comfy sofas for the library. These items are bought with the funds we raise from money makers during the year. These all help make Highland School a better place. In May, the Student Council generates ideas and needs for Highland. Then, we vote on the best item that benefits the students of our school. This past year, we bought a blue picnic table that was placed next to the playground. Here, students can sit, chat, and work on classwork or eat a snack. During the school year, we want to continue the pen and pencil sales focused around the different seasons of the year. All of our students love to buy fun new school supplies. We also will continue spirit days and service projects. We want our school to be a fun, productive learning environment for our students so they will excel in their curriculum. We want our students to come up to us with new ideas for our school or if they ever need help with anything. We also try to have many fun events throughout the year. We held our first student council meeting last Wednesday and we already have a comfy cozy day planned for November 19th. Our traditional giving tree to collect toys and warm weather wear for those less fortunate and a holiday pen and pencil sale in December. Thank you for having us speak tonight. Thank you guys very much. We, we have a couple of gifts for you. <laughs> and now to share the wonderful work that our PTA does uh, is Amanda Wiley, one of our PTA co-presidents. Thank you. And great, great job, guys. Um, thank you for having us here. Uh, we really appreciate being able to share all the great things going on at Highland. And I'm going to share just a little bit more about what the PTA has been working on. Um, I'm Amanda Wiley, I'm one of the co-presidents, uh, and my colleague, Carrie Brown-Blonde, was not able to be here today. Um, this fall, the PTA has tried out many new ideas and events so that we can meet the needs of the school while also keeping everyone safe. For example, we had an outdoor family movie night in September instead of our traditional indoor family movie night in the gym. Uh, we also had an in per I'm sorry, we had a virtual book fair instead of an in-person book fair. And then we replaced our traditional fall fundraiser, which was an in-school fun run where kids ran laps to raise money for the school, with a readathon. So kids would record the minutes that they read and then their family members and friends would donate money to support their efforts. We we're really uh, pleased that we raised nearly $16,000 in donations during our inaugural readathon this year. It's also been exciting to bring back events that have been on hold for a year or more. For example, we hosted uh, PTA Halloween parties a few weeks ago and the kids loved being able to celebrate with their friends. Uh, we also had our first treat day where the kids got cookies at school. Did you guys like that? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I thought so. Um, this week is fun lunch, so they're gonna get to have a special hot lunch at school, which should be awesome. I know that the parents are probably looking forward to it more than the kids, maybe. We'll see. Um, and we're also going to be continuing some of our annual traditions that were able to continue during the pandemic, um, but now we're, we're bringing them back a little bit differently. 
So we'll have our geography night, our one book, one school program, and our staff appreciation events as well. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share what the PTA is doing and all the things that we're trying to do to support Highland. And thank you for your support. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and gentlemen, wonderful job. And thank you all for having us, and thank you for your continued support. It's going to be a great rest of the year. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will confirm the parents do appreciate those, uh, <laughs> those lunch days. <laughs> all right. Next on tonight's agenda is a public hearing on the 2021 property tax levy. I'd like to introduce Todd Drayfall. Good evening. This is the time that uh, of the year where uh, we approve, uh, we recommend uh, for the board approval of the tax levy uh, that was introduced last month in October at the annual at the normal board meeting. This is a little bit different this year. We have a hearing, which I don't know um, if many board members have done this. It's not something we have had to do in some time. Uh, you have a truth and taxation hearing when the levy is going to exceed, the request is going to exceed 105% of the prior year's extension or the amount of money that we are, uh, should collect uh, at the end of the, at the tax uh, piece once the county clerk's done with their work. Um, we're doing this because we foresee that there's the potential uh, that we could hit that uh, given the fact that the downtown TIF, uh, downtown Downers Grove is expiring after 23 years. Uh, so in short, uh, for the last 23 years, uh, from the district standpoint looking at that property, it's been set and frozen at that value. Uh, it is redeveloped, uh, as everyone who drives through downtown knows. Uh, and has a considerable amount of increase in new property or new construction. Uh, that estimate at the end of last tax season was $68 million. That comes on uh, to the district to see access to that of that commercial property for the first time. Um, that is also new property. Understand uh, with the fact that how the tax cap works, uh, there's a potential of having an increase above the consumer price index which is 1.4% this next year. Um, the district uh, has to adopt and put a levy uh, and file a levy to the county clerk by the end of, by the last Tuesday in December. Um, we don't know the final values, new property and so forth until uh, March, April when the county clerk sends out that information when they're into that process. So we, we're working on estimates and uh, assumptions um, through this period. We budget on the lower end of what we project and assume might come in. Uh, and we certainly uh, ask on the higher end so as to be able to capture all of that that is possible. Um, other than that, the process is as uh, every other year. Um, this is, as we always say, the beginning of fiscal year 22-23 because a portion of this tax levy funds uh, the 22-23 school year as well as the remainder of the 21-22 year. Uh, a couple things to point out in the memo that's with the board, and I'll do this now during the hearing piece instead of uh, in my normal report, and that is when we, we keep a, a running total since 2006, uh, the Downers Grove community uh, has had new construction in excess of a billion dollars, which is a considerable amount of, of growth over that period of time. Uh, that's not inflation of value, that's just new construction uh, added up during that time. So um, other than that, uh, the hearing is for community members who wish to ask any question or, or make a statement about this specific topic. Um, and this is up for action for the board for this evening. And if there's any questions for me specifically from the board. 
Any questions at this time? I know we've talked about this a couple of times. All right, thank okay. you. All right, then at this time, I declare that the hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please stand, come to the podium, state your name, attendance area, and organization, if any, for the record. All right, if there's nobody who wishes to speak, then I now declare this hearing is closed at, let's see, 7.20 p.m. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are nine communications received by the board. Are there any additional communication board members would like to share at this time? Okay, and the first report to the board will be the superintendent, Dr. Russell. Good evening. November 15th marks the official statewide observance of school board member day in Illinois. The day is an opportunity to recognize Downers Grove School District Board of Education members and the individual members on the board who are committed to providing an outstanding school district for our students, staff, families, and community members. School Board Members Day is an occasion to recognize board members who serve as unpaid volunteers for the benefit of the students and community residents while also acting as frontline education advocates providing a local voice and vision for the district. Never has school board leadership been more important than the past three years. For boards of education, the recent challenges and difficult choices go beyond the routine educational decisions. While continuing to ensure students have quality learning opportunities, board members must also consider their decision in terms of the health and safety of students, staff, and community members. Please join me tonight and next week as we honor and recognize the Board of Education of District 58. On behalf of everyone in the district and community, Thank you for all that you've done and continue to do on behalf of our students and staff and community members. Normally at this time we have certificates, but because of COVID and everything, we'll just keep those in your, uh, in your packets. But again, um, thank you, November and is a Board Appreciation Month and November 15th specifically is Board Member Appreciation Day. And um, again, these last three years have been extraordinarily challenging for everyone, uh, in particular board members. So thank you so much for your service and everything that you do. For special services tonight, I'd like to update the community on a few COVID-related items. First, children ages 5 to 11 are now eligible to be vaccinated. I'd like to point out at this time, the vaccine is not mandatory and the IDPH has not indicated they plan to make it mandatory in the future. Second, the Illinois State Board of Education has amended how a school district can be placed on probation and ultimately have its recognition status revoked in the event it is not in compliance with the mask mandate. ISBE has made the process more uniform between public and private institutions. They had two different systems for the types of schools. This means that school districts must still comply with the mask mandate, however. I have received many other questions as to when the mitigation strategies will end and when things will return to normal. And I want to share with the community, I'm asking the exact same questions from our leaders at the state. If there's not a day that goes by where I don't have parents calling and saying, when is this going to end? What is the exit ramp? What is the criteria to end masks or social distancing and all of those things? The answers that I receive from all levels of the government is that the IDPH and the governor have not indicated what the plan is or what the exit strategies will be. I can assure you that it's something that we continue to advocate for so that our community, our staff, and our students have the answers that they deserve. We will continue to advocate for answers and we will share those with our community as soon as we get them. But as of today, we have not received any of that information from the state in terms of when the governor will lift the executive order. In terms of technology, the technology department is continuing to work through the logistics of the reconfiguration of our district offices. We've been in the new office for about a month and things are going well. Uh, the technology, though, does include removing older equipment from the former ASC and preparing the technology center at the uh, new DSC before and during construction. As a part of this reconfiguration, our level one technicians will be working out of the middle schools. We believe this model will allow us to provide a higher level of service by having a technician on both the north and south side of town. This transition will be completed in the upcoming weeks, and I want to thank James for his hard work organizing all of that. 
In terms of facilities, I do want to update uh, the board and community on a unique situation that we have at Pierce Downer that we typically don't have during the school year. Uh, when we turn the heat back on, we have hot water pipes that go through the buildings. Um, Kevin Bardo can certainly speak to it a lot better than I can, but we have a leak at Pierce Downer on a heating supply pipe in classroom 100. The pipe is located above the ceiling and does have older insulation containing asbestos. Asbestos is still present in many of our school spaces and can be so long as it is inspected, maintained, and not disturbed. I know that may sound alarming to our community members, but most school districts will have asbestos somewhere in their building as long as it is contained and properly handled. It is nothing to be alarmed about. The district is working with our industrial hygiene consultant, uh, forensic analytics, and IDPH to abate the piping insulation so that the pipe can then be repaired. So whenever you have to go repair something, asbestos is located, obviously there are protocols that you have to follow. This emergency project to repair the leaking heat in water pipe will occur between the dates of today and November 11, 2021. Typically any abatement work is done in the summer, but due to the emergency repair, we have to perform it now. Abatement is allowed in an occupied building, um, but since it's disruptive to the use of spaces, we would normally wait for a break. However, that isn't applicable right now. So um, we are gonna fix this. We'll get it done as soon as we can. The kids are located in a different room, but school can take place at Pierce Downer. We did notify all the Pierce Downer families and staff, obviously, of the work that's being done. But the reason I'm bringing this up in the superintendent's report is I don't wanna alarm anybody. We are following all the protocols and procedures and IDPH oversees all asbestos abatement projects. Under personnel, this is a good time to update the board on mentoring and support for new staff. Our new teachers are doing a wonderful job as they transition to District 58 this year. The administrative team has structured ongoing support for new staff throughout the year. Each newly certified staff member works with a mentor. This is the time of year when the uh, new staff uh, member is observed and receives feedback from the mentor, but also has the opportunity to observe veteran teachers within the district. There are also two new teacher meetings held during the year. The first meeting will occur later this week. That'll be led by Dr. Uzentis. The meetings are designed to focus on the continuation of important topics such as effective discipline and classroom management strategies and grading and reporting practices. We continue to be impressed with the hard work of our new employees. I also want to update the board on substitutes. Um, there is a shortage, obviously, and so we want to update the board on where we're at with substitutes. The personnel office continues to monitor the use of substitutes as well as the number of unfilled positions on a given day. Uh, though the number of unfilled positions is definitely lower than we experienced last year, there still is a shortage in the labor market. We are actively recruiting additional substitute teachers and substitute instructional assistants. This is done through communications sent by Megan Hewitt, as well as through our partnership with the Regional Office of Education. We previously increased our substitute teacher rate to $140 per day last year. That's obviously continued. That's been very um, well received. Uh, but you will notice later on the personnel report that we're um, proposing that we increase the instructional assistance sub pay to $90 uh, per day in an effort to attract more IA subs. Uh, the shortage for this particular position is felt throughout the district across the state. It's not obviously just here. Jane's going to continue to monitor this situation and I really need to just pause here and thank our principals because when there isn't a sub, they are the ones who nine times out of 10 will be jumping into that classroom and also our teachers who give up plan periods and things like that. Uh, they always find a way to make it happen and we appreciate everything that they're doing. But certainly every district is feeling the pinch, but our staff continues to step up to fill these needs and we're very grateful for that. Moving on to community relations, uh, some good news to share. The Education Foundation of District 58 recently awarded 22 grants uh, worth nearly $12,000 to District 58 teachers and staff. We're super excited about that. We had an opportunity to visit staff members who received the grant. I also want to thank uh, Member Doshi, who is our board liaison to the Education Foundation. Uh, the Education Foundation continues to support our students and our teachers and find ways to, uh, you know, promote innovation in our schools. They're also doing something very neat uh, this year. Uh, they are taking over the former Bonfield Express and they're partnering with um, the Rotary Club and the um, uh, Roadrunner Soccer Club and we will be taking over, when I say we, I'm a member of the foundation, uh, not District 58, uh, but we are gonna be taking over that race on Thanksgiving Day. We are very, very excited. There's all sorts of information out there on the web. The new name is gonna be called the Grove 
Express 5K. I would encourage anyone um, to check out the Education Foundation's website for more information on that. If you're interested in volunteering, there's also a link down there, but that's a great way to not only support our school, but the Rotary Club and the Roadrunner uh, Soccer Club. I want to personally thank Annette Bonfield. Uh, Annette and her foundation, it, um, obviously the Bonfield Express was named after her husband, have done a fantastic job. Uh, making this one of the premier running events uh, really in the state and, and certainly in the region and uh, we're excited and humbled to take this over. Uh, the Village of Downers Grove has been a great partner with us and we are excited to do that on Thanksgiving Day. So more to come on that. Just briefly a curriculum and instruction. This is typically the board meeting where we would give the school report card update. The school report card is released every Halloween night at midnight. I know it seems like an odd night to release the school report card, but that is when they do it. Um, but this year, due to COVID and not everyone taking the test at the same time, ISB really isn't releasing all of the progress report and the data at this time. So when they do release that later on in the year, we will certainly have a spotlight and update the Board of Education. If you remember, we took that test in the fall, while other districts um, took that in the spring. At one of our last board meetings, we also discussed teacher collaboration and how do we find ways to get teachers together. And a big piece of that is grade level meetings. Over the past two weeks, we conducted half day meetings with each K-6 grade level team, which included all teachers from a grade level, including reading specialists, interventionists, and resource teachers who are assigned to a, a grade level to join during the year. I wanna thank Mr. Sissel for running these meetings. We do recognize that while it's true, these meetings take teachers out of the classroom for a half a day and require an investment in our Title II funds to cover the cost of subs. The purpose of these three and a half hours to increase teacher efficacy and promote strong instructional practice in our district cannot be overstated. The feedback from these meetings was overwhelmingly positive. I think a year like this where it's so, so challenging for our staff on so many levels to be able to get together with similar peers across the district and talk strategies and instructional practices. I think it was a really, really good thing and we got very positive feedback. I'll read a few of the quotes. Um, I love meeting with other schools. Honestly, this has been one of the best grade level meetings I've been to in a long time. Not to say the others weren't good, but I'm coming away with some good manageable ideas and I think the topics covered were totally relevant. Thank you. Another one said, it is always helpful to feel like you're part of something bigger. I appreciate the opportunity to collaborate. Uh, Justin, I think that's a direct reflection of how you're leading these meetings. So again, thank you very much for organizing all those. It, it's no small feat to organize from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade and <laughs> to keep all those straight. So thank you for that. Uh, there are no business office updates. Uh, Todd just gave his with the tax levy. And just some concluding remarks. I'd like to, on behalf of the Board of Education, personally thank the Highland students, staff, leadership, and PTA for a great presentation this evening. It's wonderful to see the students back and their families at our meetings. I don't think we can understate that enough. Uh, or overstate that, excuse me. Highland School is a great deal to be proud of and it is a fantastic school community just like all of our other schools. Lastly, it's hard to believe that Thanksgiving is right around the corner. It certainly didn't feel like that outside today, um, but I hope that everyone gets to spend the upcoming holiday with family and friends. I'm extremely grateful and proud to serve as the superintendent of District 58. Mm -hmm. Certainly I have a lot to be grateful for and looking forward to the Thanksgiving holiday. That concludes the superintendent's report. Any questions? Comments? Um, can, you. can you just speak to the Pierce Downer abatement yeah. or uh, why we couldn't wait till the Thanksgiving break? Yeah, so one of the reasons we couldn't wait till the Thanksgiving break is that pipe is actively leaking water. And so if you let that go for too long, you risk that pipe you know, leak becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we felt the need to really address it. Now, fortunately for us, we could move the students into another room where we could address it uh, quickly. Otherwise, what would have had to stay in that classroom for the next, you know, two to three weeks is a leaking containment system coming through, emptying buckets of water as they, they go through. So with the heat running in the building and water going through those pipes, that's why we, we felt like it had to be done um, now and to take care of that. Um, so. That is when also uh, more workers were available to fix that where we likely wouldn't have been able to get them uh, over Thanksgiving break. And it's about a week and a half project and so we wouldn't have had enough time to complete it over uh, Thanksgiving break, excuse me. Thanks. Hmm. Kevin, did I get all that? Perfect. I was leaning to Kevin Barter, our directors of buildings and ground. <laughs> but he was wondering. Not talking to 
Yeah, I was not talking to myself. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to be clear for I want to get home. <laughs> <laughs> but stick around, that could happen. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we'll move on. Thank you. <laughs> the monthly business report <laughs> with Todd Drayfall. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I have a short allotted amount of time, and I've used up most of it. Um, you have your year to date report. Uh, there is, you know, things are, are running as normal as they are normally. Uh, with the one exception and that is transportation. Uh, you will have on your bill list tonight a larger bill um, than you've seen. One of the things to, to get an idea, our transportation, we have four uh, firms that we use for transportation. Um, they have been so busy and that means that anyone who has a driver's license and a bus driver's license is driving during the day including management, uh, office personnel, uh, that they have been delayed in getting even uh, the invoices out to us. So not a bad thing necessarily, but it's when, you know sooner or later the bill comes due. So you see that trails in the year-to-date report. Uh, it'll catch up this month. Uh, the other piece to point out is to uh, just each month is that when you look at revenue in the property tax piece that it looks higher than uh, prior years, um, and we have a bit of a larger balance of revenue over uh, expenditure that is again because of the collection um, and distribution of property taxes there was one less distribution to us in June from the county and that was pushed to July that's this reports on a cash basis July 1st is our fiscal year so you'll have that um, throughout the year as a, as a little increase but I want to continually point that out is anyone new looking at it for the first time may see that and go you know what's the increase so other than that, um, there are questions. Nick? All right. Thank you. All right, on to our committees. The first one is the policy committee, which did not meet since the last uh, board meeting, but the legislative committee did meet on October the 27th, so I'll turn it over to Member Hammonds. Thank you. Um, yes, we had our meeting on the 27th where we mostly spent our time talking about the IASB resolutions that we're going to be voting on at the delegate assembly in a couple weeks when we attend the triple i conference um the committee went through all of the proposed resolutions for this year and discussed um the iasb's recommendation for action on that resolution and then um we kind of got some recommended um action from the district and we discussed and felt in, in, to just make sure that we kind of agreed as a committee with what the administration was recommending for us to take down as our District 58's um, action on each of these resolutions. So there were just a handful of them that um, we spent a little bit more time discussing in the meeting, mostly because this the district's recommendation differed from the IASB's committee's recommendation. Um, so I'll highlight just a little bit on those, just so everyone kind of understands where we were coming from. Um, if you looked at the resolution report that they sent out in our packet, number two, which was the student safety and protection plan, um, we saw something like this similar the past two years, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, the recommending district is asking for our state legislatures to um, advocate for allowing valid FOID card holders the ability to carry a concealed firearm on campuses to promote student safety. Um, the IASB is recommending to adopt that resolution and our district's recommendation is to not adopt that resolution. Um, our feeling as a committee was that uh, more guns in school by non-law enforcement individuals is potentially just going to cause more problems than solutions. Um, so we will be recommending not to adopt that resolution as District 58 at the conference. Um, the second one we talked about was number four, which was board member child care reimbursement. Um, the, the submitting district is basically asking for allowing school board members to receive compensation for child care during school board meetings. And this is something we had a little bit of an interesting conversation around. Um, and this was, there were a couple of resolutions where we felt like the details weren't quite flushed out enough for us to get on board. It wasn't necessarily that we didn't understand or agree with 
the intent behind the resolution, but that all of the details weren't in place yet. They hadn't quite ironed it all out enough where we could we could support the resolution. Um, again, the IASB is recommending to adopt that resolution. We said that we would not adopt that resolution. Um, in general, our position was that we as board members are volunteers, and so compensating us for childcare during, during board meetings is just not really appropriate at this time. We kind of know what we're getting into when we're signing up for the board and that there's gonna be, you know, responsibilities and, and recommended or uh, re required involvement in night activities where we're gonna need childcare potentially for our kids. And so we kind of knowing that going in, we shouldn't be compensated for that. The, the conversation revolved around the idea that would this potentially, if they structure it correctly, be something that would allow more people to participate on a school board and create a more diverse, more uh, a board that would be more representative of the entire community at large. And we said, yes, that's definitely true. And that it could be something that could be helpful to a lot of people and allow more people the opportunity to serve on a board who might not otherwise have that opportunity because of childcare restrictions and things like that. Um, but like I said, just all those details were not quite there yet that we didn't feel like we could support. But something that we hope that in the future, potentially they figure out some of those kinks and, and maybe we could in the future. Because oftentimes you do see these resolutions come back year after year after they tweak things. So that was another one we talked about. Um, another one was uh, a belief statement number 22, which was prepare all students to succeed. And this submitting district um, is looking to have our legislators advocate for seeking to make grading uniform across the districts of the state. So across the state, all grading would be uniform and it would get rid of all zeros and late work. Um, again, the, the committee is recommending to adopt, our District 58 committee is recommending to not adopt that resolution. Um, essentially, we felt like these are local school board and community decisions and that they shouldn't be made on a statewide level but that we should be having the, have the opportunity to make that locally in our own community um again this was one of those where in theory there were some things about the resolution that we definitely agreed with and the philosophy behind it there are some some of the ideas that we can definitely get behind but the idea that it was kind of um uniformly put out there across the entire state was what we just didn't necessarily agree with so that was that one and then the final one was number 23 the physical and mental health of students and this um, submitting district is asking for the IASB to urge ISBE to include physical and mental health screenings in a similar man manner as health dental and vision screenings um, the IASB committee is saying to adopt that resolution we are saying to not adopt it um, again this was one of those where the devil is kind of in the details um, we felt like as a general rule, physical and mental health screenings and physical and mental health evaluations, just like we take our kids every year before school to get their physical and their vision checked and their hearing checked and all those types of things as a requirement to enter school, that, that mental health screening should be a part of that. And we felt that that's obviously equally important, but again, we had a lot of questions as to how we were going to make that happen. How are we going to ensure that those screenings were effective and um, done with fidelity and all those types of things and access to the doctors to be able to provide them for certain families and all those different kinds of things you know we talked about kind of the challenges um with mental health care in terms of insurance and, and all those different types of things there's just a lot of obstacles in the way and again in the future we hope that we were able to figure out some of those things to make this something that we could get behind and support because we do see the value in mental health evaluation and screening for all of our students just in a similar manner as we do with with the physical screenings and, and vision and hearing and things that they get every year. So those were just a couple that we kind of focused on and talked about a little bit at the committee meeting. Um, but you can see all the examples in the packet of what I will be going down and voting on as our delegate representative in a couple weeks. So are there any questions or anything else that any, any other ones that anybody wanted to talk about any further or? I, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. So um, these submitting districts that come up, I, I've I've always I've watched and I've sat there and wondered about this and then I've been up here a couple of times too. How soon do districts hand in these resolutions or like submit them? Mm -hmm. There, there's one district here who has like ten. Yeah, yeah. I believe you're talking about Champagne. Yes, right? I, I, I didn't want to call it yeah. out, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is certainly unique to this year. I can't recall. I'm sure it may have happened where one district submits so many. Um, 
you typically have to get this done months ahead of time and then submit them uh, for the IASB's consideration. Um, they send out notifications to districts to know when. Um, we have participated in things like this in the past. For instance, uh, District 99 wanted um, you know, our help putting together um, traffic zones in front of schools, you know, where it would say 20 miles an hour only when students are present. Um, the thought was to keep that 20 miles an hour all the time because you never know when students are, are going to be there and those types of things. And so we have worked on, on some of these before, but to answer your question, it's usually a couple months ahead of time. And anyone, any district can submit anything? Any district can submit it, and then the ISB has a, a, a group um, that's representative of all the districts across the, the state that will either endorse it or not endorse it, and then it gets voted on by the delegate assembly. Thank you for flushing that out. Yeah, no problem. I think just for everybody, it's important to note, too, uh, just because these things are on here doesn't mean there's any kind of pending legislation that exists. Correct. This is purely the IASB has a, has a lobbying arm, and uh, so they may be lobbying something that is in the General Assembly, may have a possibility of passing, and then often many of these things that you read really don't have much of a chance um, anyway, but it is something that they would like to start advocating for. Or, and when I say it doesn't have a chance, it might not have a chance now, but but if they add, it, that's why you see the same stuff over and over and over again, because they, they feel maybe 10 years down the road, they'll, they'll start to make uh, progress. But um, this isn't anything, we're not actually voting on anything to take particular action now, but is something that uh, the IASB will be um, representing Illinois school districts when they, when they go down to the General Assembly. And just to add one more, Illinois is such a unique state uh, for a variety of reasons, but in particular, the needs of Southern Illinois don't always align with the needs of Northern Illinois. Uh, the needs of rural school districts don't always align with the needs of urban school districts. And then even here, the needs of suburban districts sometimes conflict with larger districts like CPS. And so it is very hard. So sometimes you may read some of these and say, well, why would a district propose that? Or they're just in much different situations. And I think the firearms in school is a, is a great example of that where you know, here in the northern part of the state where we have police that can respond to our schools instantaneously, it's not always the same in other areas of the state. And so you will see some things that pop up here that we, we struggle to understand why somebody would put that on there. But, you know, they, they have a different yeah. perspective and a different set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was just going to speak uh, in general about um, number five the uh, remote the virtual school board open meetings. Um, I don't agree with this um, recommendation coming from you, Dr. Russell, and, and from the committee, uh, or from IASB. Um, I feel like uh, a remote meeting, a remote public meeting is less transparent. Um, I, I don't think that that is, um, we are going for the board. Um, I, I, I am uncomfortable with with like the lack of structure around this in terms of when this can be, when a, when a meeting can re remote, when it can be remote, wh who's allowed to be remote, um, what are the reasons why a person's allowed to be remote. Um, currently, um, you know, when we're, in, when we're not in COVID, um, if I'm out of town, I am not allowed to participate. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm on, if it's, if it's for leisure, but if it's for work, I am allowed to participate. So that there's like very few exceptions, but as far as I can tell, this, this kind of removes um, the exceptions and you are basically allowed to participate remotely um, whenever you feel like it um, as a board member um, I feel like that could be um, sending the wrong message to the community um, especially if there's a difficult vote um, and, and, and we don't have the people want to come here and to address us they don't want to address a screen um, and they want to um, they want to have the people whom, whom they elected to uh, to represent them in front of them to 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 um, have that conversation with them, and I don't feel like um, this facilitates that. So I don't I don't agree with this recommendation. And just for the record, I'd I'd like to um, just just state that. Yeah, no, I yeah, I appreciate that feedback. This is one we discussed at length, and, and Member Hannes and Member Ellis, feel free to jump in if if I miss anything. I think the committee really agreed with many of the points you just made, uh, Member Harris. Mm -hmm. I think what we were looking at, and certainly what I was looking at as the superintendent, is um, knowing that we're going into a potential referendum and, and potential construction projects and things. Um, in the event we had an emergency in the, in the summer um, where we needed to get together quickly to pay a bill or something like that, I never feel comfortable 
taking away options from a board of education to host a, a, a meeting. Um, certainly the board, if they don't feel comfortable with that, wouldn't have to do that. But as superintendent, I just wasn't comfortable recommending something that would then diminish your options as a board mm -hmm. to host a meeting. I think everything that you shared though, in terms of getting you're fighting so hard to get back to where we are now, which is a sense of normalcy where anyone from the public can attend in person, all of us being together in person. I don't think anyone in the committee would disagree that that is something that we always want to strive for. And, and I even think the committee, if this were ever become, let's say, a law down the road, I think the committee felt very strongly that we needed to put some hefty guardrails in here and, and make sure that you know this was limited there's a lot of similarities between the e-learning days uh, that, that we had in this particular one but where i was coming from with my recommendation was to give the board of education maximum flexibility in the event of an emergency but certainly preferring in person um, to the greatest extent possible yeah i agree with all of what you just said as well mm -hmm. um i think some of my thoughts just to, to respond to that would be um, like when you and I spoke about this on the phone uh, a couple weeks ago, um, when, when we just had your recommendations, I think before the committee had met, you gave the example of, of Longfellow. Um, that, that is a very time sensitive issue and, and there were some votes that had to take place over the summer. If um, three of the board members weren't available, that, that could have been a problem. And I just feel like, to, to me, that's a really great example of why we would need to meet in an emergency situation. However, the, flip, the other side of that coin is, the people who were actively engaged in that issue um, all along for years on, on who were opposed to the sale of Longfellow to not be here physically present so those people so we could hear them and hear what they have to say I feel like is maybe maybe a, uh, I wouldn't say betrayal of, of trust but I feel like that's that's just, it's just uh, it, it, it's has, it's it, it just doesn't get, it, it's unsettling to me that I think we I think when we know that there are people who are upset about an issue uh, we do need to be able to hear be here to face them uh, whether they agree with us or not um, and then um, there's another point you made, and I lost it, but it'll probably come back to me later. But um, yeah, so I, that's, I said my piece uh, on that issue. Uh, you make a couple of really good points, and I think I want to respond to something you said, and that was, well, this could use some more guardrails. Well, one of the things that, uh, Member Hannes, when you were mentioning some of the other reasons why you didn't want to adopt some of the other ones is that they weren't quite fleshed out and I, I think the same problem exists here and I'll tell you why I'm concerned about this particular item of, of all the what are we at 23 the 23 items this is one of the few that I could probably see coming across the General Assembly uh, for a potential vote and I don't think it is very f fleshed out and I'm really very concerned about this is I've already heard some complaints during COVID about meetings popping up and things being done and, and people feeling like uh, not in our district but in, in some of the other DuPage County districts that votes were happened and they, they seemed secretive and they, they did them online and or or they they threw a meeting together in, in just a couple of days and it, and nobody knew it was coming because it, you know the way they posted it and I think more than ever we really do need transparency and, and access to us and I'll tell you as is the board president who had to coordinate our remote meetings it, it's awful and I, I like just I felt like I never fully got a good read on, on how the entire board felt and yeah I don't th I don't think that that's a good move to go this wasn't something that was put in oh like an emergency situation but regular board meetings have to be done in a certain way I, I don't feel like this has been thought out in, in, in totality yet so yeah I don't I, I wouldn't agree that that we would adopt it at this point. And I thought of my other point. You, you helped me remind, uh, remind me of it. Um, you talked about guardrails, um, and I, I do have. I think this is a great board. I think we, I think we are have a lot of integrity. I think we have a, um, a lot of foresight. I think we would put in good, good guardrails. We are talking about a statewide policy, so this would affect all school districts. And again, um, there is another district in town, 99, which might have different guardrails, and and they would have that that ability to do that. So I, I mean, I. They could, they could have great guardrails too, but you never know. I just think that we, there's just a lack of, of structure around this. I think it definitely needs to be fleshed out before something that I could, I could ever support because I hear everything you're saying, Dr. Russell, and what the committee is saying about why they, they, they support um, voting in favor of this, but I think there's just too much uncertainty and um, not enough to make me feel comfortable having a policy that would allow for us to meet remotely um, in, in future years. Can I ask a question about that? Is mm -hmm. it is the main concern um, that you both have around 
having a fully virtual meeting or having the phys or the physical like one person can't make it to a meeting for whatever reason right let's say they're gone um, out of town mm -hmm. right and they want to attend the meeting and they want to vote in the meeting and they can't because you're not allowed if it's a vacation or if it's a you know you're not allowed to do that it's only if you're on a business trip that you can call in and participate in a board meeting is I that the concern or is it more about fully virtual allowance I think if I was the if I don't see a problem with one board member not being allowed to participate that that is that is the only person who suffers is that is that one board member and that one that one board member had a plan plan vacation where a meeting came up and me not being able to vote on something that I I, I feel strongly about isn't um, well, I don't know if it's necessarily just voting. I think it's participation and, sure. and being engaged in the conversation on an ongoing basis. Sure, um, but I mean, like that's that is that is is, is a, I guess I mean I can see your point of view, but that's not um, a reason to allow virtual meetings to exist as a as a as a policy just because I might go on a vacation sometime and I want to I might want to participate in, in a conversation because I do think. It opens up the door. It, it, it's a crack in the door, and the door opens larger because if you might be out one month, or I might be out one month. Mm -hmm. Next meeting it might be two or three people, or and it, it, there's no, there's nothing here that says you have to even have. You don't even have to have a majority of the members present. That's the problem. You could have two or three people here. You could have four people remote, and that doesn't even say you have to have one or two people here. It's a, you could have a fully remote meeting, and that's where yeah. I mean, I see that's, that's it's the lack of guardrails. It's the lack of, of me understanding what this looks like and what I'm supporting. And, and absent that, I can't support it. Okay. Any other comments on that or any of the other uh, resolutions? I have a comment on number 23, but I don't want to take us off topic. Go ahead. Right. All right. Um, there's, there's a, this one is about uh, physical and mental health of students. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a uh, place where policy will help move public health, local policy in the right direction. And if I was to project like 20 years from now, the fact that we don't cover mental health as well as we do physical health and insurance, the fact that we don't cover it well in education is going to be like, what were you guys doing in the 2010s? Like that just seems ridiculous. Um, this is a step, I believe, in the right direction where policy can significantly change the trajectory of how local health providers operate, how local school boards operate, how local education systems operate in a really productive way. Um, it, in essence, requires, if this would, would ever to go to General Assembly, would require that we treat mental health just as we treat physical and dental health. And, uh, and uh, that's something that I very much support. I think we do our students a disservice by not uh, asking our healthcare providers to think about this just as much as they think about physical health. Uh, and so I think this would be a really good step in the right direction. Uh, so I'd love to get this group's thoughts on what, what was the uh, reason to not ask policy to be in the lead rather than follow public sentiment. Correct. This was a really hard one for me and I talked about this at the committee meeting a lot um, because I have children that struggle with mental health challenges and I've dealt a lot with the inequity, especially in insurance and things like that with how mental health is covered versus physical health and, and all those kinds of challenges. And it does create tremendous inequities. You know, I'm lucky that I can provide that for my children. And there are a lot of families that would absolutely not be able to provide it should their child need it because of cost and things like that. Um, and so I completely agree with you that I think we are way behind the times in kind of eliminating that stigma, that negative stigma of mental health challenges. Um, especially for kids. I mean, my goodness, we, you know, we talk all the time about how our, our children are struggling, you know, with their mental and emotional health, especially because of COVID and all those things. And, and so this was, this was a challenge for me. I, I, we talked a lot about this in the meeting. And I think part of the, I think a lot of the struggle was more around how do we, how do we guarantee that um, the, mental health providers like would these screenings be done simply by the children's pediatrician in their regular annual physical that they receive which there already is a little bit of that in the physical like they'll ask you a couple questions oh how do you feel you know but that's it's very surface um it's certainly not going to really get at any major mental health challenges that a child might be facing in my opinion from my experience um but how is that done then is it done separately at a at a you know from a mental health physician and 
how how do parents who don't have access to that get to that point? I mean, I, we just thought there were some challenges in place that we needed to see um, discuss a little bit better. But I completely agree with you, Krat, that this is something that is. I agree that I think we'll look back and say, like, how did we let that go so long without addressing it? Because um, I do think it's something that that we need to start tackling much sooner rather than later. But there were just a few concerns and questions I think that we just weren't quite sure how we would or how a school district would would ensure that it was done correctly and that and that all families would have the, the access they needed to to get those screenings um, but I kind of pushed back a little bit and said you know if we, if we do it for physical health and we do it for vision and hearing and you know kind of like what's the difference um, was my question but the, the committee as a whole kind of felt like we weren't quite there yet. We weren't quite ready. Um, so it was just, this, this was a tough one. We talked about this one quite a bit. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Emily. I, I, Crowd, I, I would sum up the committee is feeling that I don't think anyone in that room would disagree that, that mental health is not just as important as physical health and emotional health and, and social health. Um, I think what the committee was struggling with was just envisioning what would that look like in schools? Um, you know, privacy laws, HIPAA, you know, when, how would we check that in, in not having that more fleshed out? I think that that was the reason for not going with the, the recommendation, um, just needing a little bit more information. But surely I, in, in um, you know, members Hannes and Ellis, please, if, if I'm getting it wrong, I think everybody is in line with mental health requires just as much attention as, as physical health. Um, I think we were just trying to envision what would this look like. I think there was also concerns as well about in the event something like this would go through, what if given the insurance issues that we have around mental health, um, knowing that so many people do not have coverage for that, we could inadvertently be putting a family in, in you know, a tough situation where now they're now required to get a certain screening and not having enough insurance coverage for that. Again, we may have been going too far with some of our concerns, but not having a vision for what that looked like, I, I think was was worrying the committee, but the concept, I don't think anyone disagreed with. Right, so I think I can um, mm -hmm. sum it up pretty quickly from my perspective, what the, the belief statement as written made a lot of sense to me. It just says they believe that the overall physical and mental health of our students is of prime importance. No questions there, absolutely that's very true. It was the rationale piece that says that um, belief statement number to include mental, physical, and dental examinations in addition to the already stated vision. And that didn't match with the actual belief statement. So the rationale and the belief statement weren't lining up and it didn't make sense to me what they're trying to do with this. And I had brought up in that meeting exactly your same things about that you have to push, that there's, there's an alignment that happens around these things where it can start to push policy forward and start to push legislation forward and start to align everything across. And I know that the healthcare, um, the healthcare environment is doing this right now as well. They're expanding their mental health screenings by the physicians. Um, I think that Kevin was gonna look to IDPH to see what they knew about that so that we could maybe talk about that a little bit more in depth. But um, the belief statement change made sense, right? It was the rationale that didn't make a lot of sense to me. I obviously wasn't part of the conversation um, on this and I hadn't put a lot of thought onto it, but I think one of the challenges that I have with advocating for something like this that I think would be a bit of a, of a strong shift, we don't know what the impact would be of us taking mental health records and stuff like that in the school district. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time advocating for something before legislation has been flushed out. What I worry about sometimes is you, you start advocating for something with the best of intentions and have a vision for what that means. And then what ends up getting created around uh, school districts lobbying for something ends up not being something that we end up being comfortable with. But our voice was used to create something that might not be what we think serves our community or students well. Um, I, I think it becomes much easier at some point if this starts uh, coming up later in the General Assembly or where, um, wherever it might start to arrive and it, and it has a structure to it, we have an ability then to look at it and say, does that serve our students, does that serve our community well? I, I think that 
something this broad with something this serious can actually sometimes do more harm than it can do good. And uh, so for that reason, I really like where we landed on this. Um, maybe this organization, I don't know what school submitted it, but um, uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, maybe they will continue to, to work on this and, and build more language around it to something that we as a, as a school district can, can get behind. But at, at this point, I, I understand There's what you're saying. I, I, one thing about one thing that, and we again, this was something that we kind of discussed in the committee meeting was that, you know, you say, um, you kind of mentioned the idea of, well, you know, the concept or the idea in theory of a school district like taking the mental health information of students and that like worries you. And w right now, we currently, we take the physical health information of our students. And we have that and we know about it and it's mm -hmm. that's not worrisome so it, it almost it's creating a difference between the two it's creating that it's okay to have this information but it's not okay to have this information because and it, it i could see what where some people might then think that it creates a little bit of a stigma it creates like a difference there's a difference between the two and this one is more scary or dangerous to have than this one and that's where the difference arises and i think that's what the bill is supposed to or that's what they're trying to kind of say there shouldn't be a difference there's there shouldn't be necessarily anything scary or shouldn't make us apprehensive to have that information because that information is just as important to have as the physical and it shouldn't be something that we're like oh that's too much you know i i think that's where the push is coming from um but i understand what you're saying i because i tend to agree i think while i i was definitely have struggled with this a lot and I had a hard time with that. I, I think that we do need to give this one maybe one more year just to get past some of those hurdles, but I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to take away that, the difference between physical and mental. Why is there a difference? We have the physical information, why can't we have the mental? It's not really different, well, or it shouldn't I, be. And I think, not, I, I think, again, like I think that there's a difference between a belief statement and a resolution, right? Belief statement isn't, you're advocating or support or you're not going to make legislation happen from your belief your belief statement is here's generally and correct me kevin if i'm wrong i'm newer to this but your belief statement is just generally here's what it's like a mission or vision right mm -hmm. here's what we believe generally we're not going and like pounding the door in springfield saying you guys need to pass stuff related to this and that's where this didn't match because i didn't understand why the committee rationale went this direction and they started talking about the mental health examination because the belief statement makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. on its own by itself. The resolution committee's rationale did not make a lot of sense to me because that's where they started digging into we should require there to be examinations. And that's moving to me into that resolutions piece a little bit more mm -hmm. than into a general belief statement. Am I pinning the tail on the dog well, pee? You're, you're exactly right in, in my view. It was a tough one. That was a tough one. Yeah, yeah the, the one thing I would say about all this, and, and I want to commend the board, you know, policy is one of the most fundamental jobs a board of education has. And I know of no district that takes their work more serious than District 58 in terms of thoroughly examining these and not just going through the motions on them and then also following up with our policy committee work. So these are tough things where not all seven are going to agree up here and certainly not all 832 school districts across Illinois are going to agree um, so the delegate our delegate assembly is something that um, I always enjoy going to it's, it's interesting to hear the dialogue and but you can start to see um, things on the horizon and what will take shape down the road so I appreciated the conversation with the committee we, we have um, new members on our committee they dove right in and started having some good conversations with our community members and, and I, I think that's a great thing so a lot of people had a chance to discuss all of these things back and forth Absolutely. Okay. any more questions on uh, resolution number 23 or any other other resolutions thank you member Hannes all right, uh, next up is the Financial Advisory Committee. Um, we did meet on November the 5th. Uh, um, this was not a heavy meeting, as it was more related to um, review of the documents. We didn't have a big discussion item, so we reviewed the tax levy in preparation uh, for tonight's meeting, so I won't uh, bore you with that. Uh, we re-reviewed, we, we did not have a, a meeting last month, so we just had an opportunity to have a discussion with the FAC on what the insurance rates were, though this board already took action on that. 
And then we looked at the year-to-date report and had some more discussions around things like uh, the lack of bills received from transportation, which now are coming in. So we will see a spike uh, in that. But my understanding is that it's been all hands on deck, including the, the folks that normally do the billing are actually behind the wheel. So I, I, you know, I just want to commend our, our transportation companies because our, our kids have been getting to school and, and that's been incredibly important to us so um, but that was it it was a, a relatively uh, light meeting uh, for us uh, last Friday any any questions all right then that concludes my report all right the district leadership team did not meet in September uh, the health and wellness committee did meet on November the 4th uh, sure uh, we had our meeting on Thursday at Herrick we are now um, traveling as a committee <laughs> um, because we are no longer have the ASC as the option after school because we don't uh, want to use the meeting space and, and pay for that. So we're just kind of uh, touring around the buildings and seeing which ones we like the best. Um, we um, spent not too much time talking about the data. It wasn't, it wasn't a tr terribly exciting month for, for our, our claims. Um, with uh, where, where we are year to date, we are looking at a deficit of about $170,000 that is um, projected to get better over, over what we looked at. So we didn't have October data yet. So we still have three more months, October, November, December. Um, we are, uh, projections are, uh, are, are telling us that we should be getting a little bit closer to balanced, um, but still probably a small surplus of about fifty to $60,000. Um, and, and before, uh, just to remind everybody that about, you know, when you hear the, the, the word deficit, that's, that's not a great word to hear, but just remember we had a tremendously large surplus last year, and we did at the October meeting approve the, um, the, the premium increases for three of the four plans. So everything um, is, is taken care of for, for calendar year 2022 to uh, protect the uh, stability of, of our plans. Uh, we did spend uh, the bulk of the meeting talking about um, our, our, our wellness incentives and our wellness um, programs. Um, with, with the with the, an eye on having a, a healthier staff, um, that that you know there's there's as a committee we need to have a healthier staff because we want to keep our claims down. Obviously, um, if we can um, be proactive and and, and uh, identify our staff members, our, the members of our plan who are let's say pre-diabetic uh, now, and, and get them to make some life changes to stave off a, a, a more serious, more costly disease later on, that's great for the plan. However, what we think uh, you know we think of. We, we think of a community as the human term. In the human terms, um, we want to have our, our coworkers um, health, healthy and happy. We want them to be coming to work um, every day and, and with kids. And so that's that's the way we we approach the, the issue. We did have some some um, figures from the last screening we did. Um, participation was down, and we we tried to figure out some ways why that might why that might be to explain that. Um, so only the thirty we've done this. So a, 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 a dip like that is not. Um, not the best news because we want to be getting more people. The more people we have, the more data we have, the better the program will be. Um, so we troubleshot that and try to think about some other ways to um, encourage more participation in future years. And then we also talked about um, you know just the education piece. Now that we we've helped some of our, our, our members talk about uh, learn about their their health in, in a new way that they, they may not have gotten before. Now how do we give them uh, the information they need to make some better decisions? That's it. Any questions, comments? All right, that brings us to our discussion item tonight, uh, which is the next step for the portrait of a graduate and the key performance indicators and strategic planning. So, all right, well, uh, I want to welcome up uh, Justin. Uh, Mr. Sissel will be taking the first half of the presentation, and I will take the second half. Justin will be discussing uh, the key performance indicators, and I will be discussing the next steps for strategic planning. One of the goals that we have is to continue to use the district leadership team as the vehicle for these conversations, but we also want to make sure that other important uh, groups in the district, like the Curriculum Council, also provide us input. And most importantly, we want to make sure that the board is involved every step of the way, because what we don't want to have happen is we get to a point where we start making final recommendations on the KPIs and the board isn't in the loop and may have to go against something that the curriculum council or the district leadership team may recommend. And so your feedback is essential as we go through this because the point of tonight's discussion is to get feedback from the board that we can then take back to the district leadership team next Monday and have a really good, rich conversation around key performance indicators and also the next steps for the strategic plan. So with that, uh, Justin will take over and start talking about key performance indicators. Thank you. Over the past several board meetings, we've had a lot of conversations that center around the question of how we're defining success. How are we going to know that we have 
met and achieved reasonable and rigorous targets in every given year. And so what we've been talking about is really the convergence of two key components of that. We have the portrait of a graduate descriptor that is part actually of our strategic plan report. It's not something that, that to be fair, we've done a lot with. It's been part of the strategic plan and, and over the past couple of years, we've asked some groups to look at those characteristics and try to discuss and, and see how we might refine and revise them. As you know, we've also had key performance indicators that initially focused on solely academic measures. We measured map, ma uh, math and reading in a couple of different assessments and also subgroup performance. And so as we move forward to try to, to come to this ultimate definition of success, we want to bring these two ideas together, which will help, as, as Kevin alluded to, have a consistent definition, but also a consistent way of measuring student success across the system. And one of the things we have to think about is that each indicator, each trait that we bring up, we're committing then to measuring for each individual student. A and the reason we make that commitment, I'll talk about this in a couple slides later, is once we have data for each individual student, we can then filter it and sort it in, in any different way. So we can talk about the third graders at building A or the entirety of building B or district level or classroom level data because we have it for each individual student. And once you have the information, then the sorting and, and aggregating is, is actually not necessarily simple, but straightforward. So tonight, I want to share with you draft descriptors that would define that concept of portrait of a graduate and then really drive what we would measure in terms of success and, and, and drive a lot of those key performance indicators. What we're asking for tonight, as Kevin said, is your, your feedback, but really your initial feedback. Tonight is, are we on the right track? The, 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 the wordsmithing, the final phrasing, all of that will be done over the course of the next few months, and you'll see a timeline later that will bring it back to the board at several um, touch points before we get to a final uh, decision and on those descriptors and all of those measurements. And the other thing too, I know it's, it's tempting to jump right into, well, how will we measure that? And what I'm asking you to do tonight is put that question a little further out. I'll give you some general terms tonight, but really tonight I wanna, I'm hoping to focus on the what so that we know that we're on the right track and have the board's encouragement to continue down this road. So working with the Curriculum Council and then a small group to kind of, of, of bring their feedback together, we've got seven descriptors that we're, that we're sharing at this point. So the four on the screen right now sort of fall under the academic side of things. Proficiency in grade level standards and academic skills, and then also growth relative to those same things. So the first two really are gonna have to do with those measurements that we're very used to. Um, and then the third, social emotional competencies, another piece about that healthy self-perspective, positive relationships. These are pieces of the strategic plan of a lot of the feedback we've gotten. And then the fourth that sort of fell into that academic category is the ability to communicate, orally, written, and, and listening as well, not only to, to just have the functionality, but also to make sure that, that students' voices are able to be part of all of their experiences going forward. So I, I imagine we'll come back to these slides, but that's the academic group. On the other side, more of those learner behaviors that we talk about. And so critical thinking skills, developing solutions to complex problems, collaboration with others with, in a way that respects multiple viewpoints and multiple perspectives. And then lastly, the one that, that I think is, is a, a statement a lot of the times we're in right now, that resilience, the confidence to continue on with their learning and contribute to their community. These are things that are part of a lot of, a lot of the skills we are already teaching and, and part of the, you know, many of our standards and when you think about the mathematical practices and some of the things Common Core even asked us for, it's all in there. And so these are sort of the categories that again came out of numerous conversations most recently with the Curriculum Council. When we get to how, again generally speaking, what would happen is we would develop at least one or, if, or a couple KPIs along each of those descriptor, descriptors that would allow us to measure those things. We really want to talk about proficiency and growth across the board, and we've talked about this quite a bit as a school board and as a community. You know, proficiency gives us that consistent, we want to make sure we're not, we are maintaining performance over time. But growth really helps us understand the impact of our efforts, and so are the things we're doing in a given year providing the results that we want to see beyond just maintaining overall proficiency. Both are important, side by side is, is, is really powerful. And as I mentioned, we would, everything would happen at the individual student level, just like we, we individually assess students in MAP and AIMS with. Any of these kinds of measurements would be for individual students. And to that end, we also don't want to suddenly create 
multiple additional assessments simply to respond to the portrait of a graduate or to the KPIs. A lot of this information we already collect in a number of different ways and that's what we're going to try to work to refine and streamline so that we're not layering additional surveys and assessments on top of things but we're using the information we already have. One of the things I do want to highlight in terms of the, both the what and the how is our initial consultative relationship with ECRA that we've talked about a little bit. As we've worked more with them, ECRA has a lot to offer us in terms of both data analysis, but also developing personalized targets and predictions. You know, we, we right now we have NWEA who will give us a growth target, but that target is simply based on a student that is X number of years and months old that started at this point. It's expected to get to this point. It's actually a more generalized target than I think we might tend to think, whereas some of these individualized targets can really help us ensure that our, our growth metrics and all of that are, again, both reasonable and rigorous for our students. And so ECRA is um, going to likely become more of a partner with us in this process. We're working on the scale and scope of that, and I would anticipate bringing back some more information about an ongoing relationship with ECRA in terms of working with us to not only um, define some of these measurements, but also to, to really take a look at our student data and help us set targets. That, that's really one of the pieces that is the work that we're hoping to, to gain a lot of perspective from. ECRA works with a number of school districts across Illinois and nationally, but specifically in Illinois. And often we talk about who do we want to compare ourselves to? Who do we want, what, you know, are measuring against state standards, against national standards, but also against districts that look like us, demographically speaking. And I think ECRA can help us quite a bit with those measurements. So again, tonight we begin the conversation with the board. Next Monday, the district leadership team will meet, taking the board's feedback from tonight into consideration and really fleshing out some of these details. We'll bring it back to the entire administrative team. We'll come back to the board, hopefully, with a conversation around ECRA next month. The curriculum council meets again in December. We have a board meeting in Monday to have another touch point for discussion to see kind of where we're at. And then our hope is that by the curriculum, by February 28th, we have a district leadership team meeting as well as the curriculum workshop on that night. And so our, our, our hopeful timeline is that that's when we'll be able to present, um, with ECRA's support, a relatively final product that could then be formally adopted the following month in March. And that adoption timeline really helps us then as we're starting the school improvement planning process for the following year, as we're looking at all of those overall goals, having those success descriptors and indicators in place by March 14th would be really beneficial for all of that board. So that's our first pause point here, really just to say again, here are kind of the big questions. Are, do, do we feel like we're headed in the right direction? Is there anything that the board would like to see further included or discussed or any specific next step questions that we want to make sure we can bring back each month as we come back? I, I have a question. Sure. And it's not on measuring because you said put it away. <laughs> <laughs> Putting it away. Um, the question I have is are we are we taking our students, are we, I guess it's a weird question, but are we using this to help develop our programs or are we taking our programs as they exist and expanding them to meet the student to, to be able to attain these goals, right? Mm -hmm. is, is this attainable with what we currently have in programming and curriculum or is it supposed to work hand in hand or is that still being sorted? No, that's a great question. I, I think, yeah, and I think it does all work hand in hand to some degree. I think, you know, the, the, we, we have a lot of different data that we use, and we have classroom level information when we talk about how our students doing and what kind of assessments are we using, but I think bringing this, this, this discussion to closure to say these are some of the things we value as a board and as a community, and these are some of the targets we want to set, then helps us to ensure, okay, if this is what we believe, are the, is the instruction we have, are the programs we have, are the resources we have leading us to those goals. So I, th I think it, it does go hand in hand. You know, four or five years ago when we set the last set of KPIs and all of this, we were in the midst of trying to establish consistent core curriculum. So a lot of the KPIs and plans reflected that. We needed to get that in place. We have that now. And so now I think we, it, it's an exciting time to get a little more specific on, okay, what are those skills that we want to ensure that we are focusing on for our students each year across the system? And then if we are, you know, I'll, we'll equate it to the school improvement planning process. We're defining the data that will, will be that first group of, of information that buildings will look at and say, how well are we doing? And then as they go through that root cause analysis, 
That's where they'll, they'll answer those questions. Do we need more of something, less of something? How is it working? That, that kind of process will happen at each level. So the short answer to that is I really think it's going to go hand in hand over the next couple of years. And then my, my second question on this is, um, oh gosh, okay, I'm going to try to remember, is on the items around uh, social emotional learning and ability to communicate and ability to act in a certain way, those are all really very student specific where they are in a certain range, right? Um, uh, whether or not you have an IEP or you don't have an IEP. Are there different standards? And I know this is kind of creeping into measure, but I'm hoping not That's too okay. much. Um, are there going to be different sets of expectations of portrait of a graduate that meet those students where they are? Right, and so that's the power of making sure that the growth component is included in all of those measurements. Because okay. when you, you're right, when you talk about just a standard of proficiency, we can identify students who have, have been, are identified because they are not meeting that standard. So then the question becomes, how do we make sure that they are growing in a current year at an appropriate amount. And, and really, as we continue to work with ECRA, they can bring it down to a much more personalized growth target for each student, that then when you combine all of those personalized targets, it, it, it factors into what a class target would look like or a building target. So again, by including growth in measurement of any of this, we allow for the variety of starting points that our students have, and we set targets based on what that starting point is, and really what we know about that student in prior years, to make sure that it does account for the fact that our students are going to start at different places and, and grow at different rates, honestly, based on where they start and what else is part of their profile. And then my last one, and I won't make this a measure thing either, but <laughs> trying very carefully, but I think uh, something that I'd like to be able to keep an eye on is um, who's assessing the children, what are their qualifications to assess the children on these different items, um, you know, are they being trained in a certain way? I think those are all very important as we move forward through this process is how are we ensuring that whoever's assessing these various new standards that aren't just measurable data that we have fed to us essentially who, who amongst us in our community in our community of uh, staff are going to be able to do these things um, and will it take away from instructional time okay. that, yeah no that, that's a great point and, and again I think when we start to unpack some of these behaviors we actually are measuring some of these things in different ways now through some of our reporting mechanisms yeah. it's just a question of looking at aligning some of those things so i agree our, our our hope is not to layer on additional assessments that are going to take away from instruction but to really kind of just look at streamlining the information we're already collecting the the, the training and that sort of concept of like iterator reliability is another good one to think about as we move forward with that though. so thank you thank you a lot of my thoughts are probably going to come after the, the second half, but I do want to piggyback on, on one thing that you said. As we get into developing these, um, the, when, you, when you create a KPI, a KPI often looks like we want to see 85% of students reach X, Y, or Z, thing, things along those lines, right? Um, I, I think one of the things, by having these individualized scores, like you're talking about, we may be looking at it at the aggregate on this level. I think one thing I'd like to make sure that we're capable of doing is that X percentage that doesn't meet the, that we're saying, all right, 80, 80, I'm just using these numbers because we're easy, right? 85% meet or, or exceed our, our goals, and then we have this other percentage. I think, it's, I think it's important for us to hear the narrative that goes along with that um, as well, in that there are a certain percentage of kids that we really have well, while we're measuring it at, at, at a standard, you know, is, is a district because we have to, um, some of these kids have alternate goals that we may have set for them as well. I mean, anybody who's been in education, you know, know that there's been kids in the classroom, their goal is to, to be able to do X, Y, or Z, and, and, and they're very different from the goals of the rest of the kids in the classroom. So it would be nice to be able to hear a, you know, celebrate the win if we're exceeding our goals, but also hear a little bit about the work that we're doing, and I think those growth uh, aspects are going to be uh, really important. The other piece that I think makes sense here, and just that we're sort of defining it, is the idea of the portrait of a graduate, I think, is a really exciting one, and it didn't, we didn't get to the place that I think we wanted to be when we first started out this initiative, but I think that's okay. We, we've, we've accomplished a lot of things in this period of time, and we got a little bit uh, sidetracked here the last year and a half. 
Uh, one of the aspects, though, that started coming up in a conversation when I, when I served on the district leadership team was sort of building beyond just the portrait of a graduate. And what I mean by that is sort of having multiple checkpoints in there. That's what and, I mean. and that would be that maybe like a s end of second grade, end of fifth grade, end of eighth grade, right? So one of the things we were just having a discussion on the other day was reading comprehension of our, our first grade. Well, you know, maybe a goal of the end of second grade would be to be at a certain reading level, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, I think having different checkpoints in there so that we don't get to the point where we're getting kids in the sixth and seventh grade and then realizing we're a little bit off of our trajectory of reaching that final portrait of a graduate. So that would be something, I don't know how everybody else feels about that, but that would be something I would like to see is sort of broaden that a little bit, kind of in, you know, you have your um, early elementary, your intermediate, and, and sort of then your end of middle school um, design. It can be all part of one plan. It doesn't have to be three different things, but there's sort of, you know, um, there's a trajectory there as opposed to just a, a finish line. No, and, and that, 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 thank you. That's been part of many of the conversations, and I think that's where, you know, whether it ends up reflected as a second grade checkpoint, a fifth grade checkpoint, or whether we develop these KPIs that can be scaled at any at, at different grade levels at different points in time. That's really some of the, the power of this work is if we if we have consistent definitions, then we can we can look at grade level A or, or group or, or subgroup Y at any different point and also kind of look at what those specified targets ought to be. So definitely the ability to be able to track that more than just saying by the time you graduate, but you know right. what is the what is the trajectory to get you there? So we'll, we can definitely continue that conversation. Yep. Yeah, that okay. that came up at so that was when you were still on it. I, I was going to ask that was my question. Oh, was it? Yeah, is when there was discussion about not just waiting all the way till eighth grade, but like Jaron said. So where where does that discussion fall in line with all of this? Is that a separate so, thing, or is that built into this? I think, Does I that think it, my yeah, I think it works together. And I think that the other thing is, you know, we're using this phrase, portrait of a graduate, right? What are the skills that we want our students to leave our system with? But we don't start teaching those skills in middle school, right? We're, we're, they're, they're, they're part of their entire educational system. And so, the, you know, the portrait of a graduate gives it a nice, a nice phraseology, but, but the, the conversation of where are these skills explicitly taught and measured goes throughout our system developmentally in different ways, whether we're talking about reading and writing or whether we're talking about critical thinking and problem solving. Like all of those things are, are taught throughout. And so even when we were writing some of these, it got difficult to separate, you know, when you're, the, the idea of a graduate is a landing point, but growth doesn't match that exactly because it's not at any one landing point. So we're going to ha have to kind of just, you know, I think think about it a little more flexibly than the graduate or those immediate things and more look at let's let's use that that frame what are the skills we want to know that our students possess and then make sure that we are building all of that into our entire instructional system so that that we, we can say that yes the vast majority of them will possess those skills when they do eventually leave our system and go on to what's next i think one thing i, I think that's what I, kind of something i was going to say in response to Darren's was that i like the idea of having I almost would want to see like on the the quarterly report cards or whatever where you know you have all of your numbered items and they tell you're a two you're a three year or whatever but at the end at the end they always have the narrative section where the teacher gives a couple comments at the end i skip all the numbers and i go straight to the narrative because i want to hear what did they what are they going to say about my kid i don't want to hear my kid in the form of numbers i want to know what do they think of you know how is my child in the classroom how do they behave how do they act what is the teacher's perception and i think a lot of these um a lot of these things that are not like very as data driven like growth and achievement in the academic areas they're very subjective and so it's something that is much more easily described in a narrative form in an anecdotal form and so it, i would think it might be something that could be really beneficial to have almost like have all of these seven things or at least certainly the ones that are not as um, data driven particularly like the first two um, have them somehow um, anecdotally described narratively each year or twice a year or whatever for the parents to see. So on the report card, there's literally a section that says, talks about curiosity and critical thinking and talks about collaboration and talks about um, passion and grit and resilience. And the teacher speaks anecdotally to what they see in that child in those areas. So you can, as a parent, can see what has, how is my child doing in those areas? I think those are incredibly important life skills that no matter where you 
end up in your life, those are things that you need to have, regardless of the academic content that you take and carry on to your career. Those are things that everybody needs to have in their career and so, or their future life, whatever the case may be. And so I think that might be a really interesting way to transfer some of that information. And I don't know, like in terms of, we talked about like the, the measurement of that, I'll be really curious to see how we're gonna go about measuring some of those things. I can't wait to hear, I'm so excited. Um, but I think a narrative discussion around some of those ideas once or twice a year could be really, really valuable for parents and for students and for the staff to be able to look back and then see, okay, in first grade, this is what teacher A said about this student in terms of resilience and how has that changed from year to year and just all those types of things. I think that can be really beneficial. I, I think I think we're articulating some of the challenges of some of these, uh, you know, it, of how to measure and best articulate some of these things. And so I think again, if we're going back to are those things on those areas the the right ones for us to pursue, then those are exactly the next set of conversations. I mean, I I, I love the idea that you just shared. I know the teachers watching are going, oh my gosh, I'm that would sure. be a lot of right. Sorry, teachers. But I think so. I think there, again, it, it's a question of how do we balance all of that desire to to measure and explain and 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 know where our students are at on this continuum of the things that we define as the things that we value and, and that's the work that we'll be doing for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is amazing. I, I'm really excited um, about these seven behaviors and descriptors that we've des described here. Um, I think I really like to see um, all of the emphasis on some of these, like I said, kind of these life skills, things like communication and collaboration and things being emphasized a lot, that makes me very excited to, for, for the future in, in the district and things like that. One thing I'm curious to see, um, I was kind of looking back at, at the previous portion of graduate things from, from before, and one thing I'm curious to hear if, if it was discussed at all in DLT is this kind of the idea of like civic responsibility or um, kind of like playing a productive or an active role in our democracy. There was one thing in the previous one that said, embraced or and displays social and global citizenship. That was like in the old portrait of a graduate descriptors. Um, and it, I'm curious if you think that that sort of falls into one of these current categories or if that was something that was discussed at all, kind of the idea of being like a productive member of our society as a citizen and things like that. So yes, it, was, it certainly was discussed. And okay. I think that's where, you know, how is that measured? So really, I think it's somewhere, it, it's in both of these last two, uh -huh. mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that middle, that second one really talks about the ability to, com to collaborate in the classroom and beyond. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, that awareness and respect of multiple perspectives kind of gets to that, that citizenship understanding. Uh -huh. And then also the, you know, that last one just really does call out lifelong lead learners, leaders, and contributors to their community. So right. I think it's definitely incorporated in both of those. Okay. And there was some good conversation about what that could and should look like. I think really it's that second one where, you know, that skill we want you to be a contributing member is really going to be having to understand how to productively, respectively, with awareness, contribute to bigger conversations. Uh -huh. So I think it, I, I, I would say it's mostly embedded in that second one. Great, right. thank you. Thank you. I think I just want to make one more comment uh, on the portrait of a graduate piece. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I was emphasizing maybe it in, in two or three parts and, and why I think that's a little bit different than maybe just reviewing it annually is that kids may be learning things at a, at a slightly different rate. And so when you kind of break this off, in, in my head, thirds make sense, right? You know, um, it might take some students a little bit longer to get to the part, but is, is they're approaching third grade, maybe they have a certain set of skills, and as they approach sixth grade, maybe they have a certain set of skills. Uh, that's kind of why I'm breaking it down like that, in that we have sort of these models that are, are larger checkpoints than just the annual ones that we're looking at, and kind of trying to look at that trajectory of making sure that we have these, these larger checkpoints as opposed to just looking at kids when they come out of, uh, it, it sort of becomes cumulative then, right, over, over these last three years, Maybe you didn't get here at the exact same rate, but are you here? And it gives us sort of one last shot, I think, to, to look and see, do we need to take additional um, interventions? And I think when we're looking as, as a group saying, this is really a landing point of where this stuff starts to become critical um, and is really going to start to impact maybe another part of your learning. I think the reading is, you know, 
I, I think you described it to me as you know, kind of K through two, you're you're learning to read, and then you know, and then as you get older than that, you you read to learn, and so did we set a foundation there that they can be successful in, in the later grades? Um, that is why I'm looking at it more more than just an annual thing, but kind of a kind of a broader broader step there. No, I appreciate that. And I think that's, those are exactly the kind of questions we want to bring back to the groups and also yeah. to our consultants because these are the, you know, they're the ones who have expertise across multiple districts in terms of what, you know, what, what measurements make sense and are yeah. manageable and help us through that. So absolutely, we'll, we'll bring the conversation around. Any other comments before we go to the second half? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, I want to just co-sign uh, the points being made around checkpoints. I really like that framing and I think that's a really good push for, for the DLT. And, and the work that we're doing with the consultants. So, so thanks for that. Um, there's a couple of things that uh, we have the benefit of being a K-8 district where our students don't go on to a very unstructured system of post-secondary life or career or job or workforce. They go on to high school, right? Uh, and in, in, in the US, we have a great K-12 to system that um, isn't replicated in, uh, in as many other countries. Uh, but what that benefits us here is being able to work with our high school counterparts and find out what is it that when, when we hand off students from 8th grade to ninth grade, uh, there's been a lot of research over the last decade talking about ninth grade on track. Uh, and I, I wonder how we can extend that either down to K through 8 uh, or how we can lean on our high school leadership counterparts to help us frame a portrait of graduate as it leans into what ninth grade on track and the ninth through 12 system looks like that they will inevitably be entering. Uh, so more of a, just a th I'd love for us to coordinate with our, our high school teams uh, to, to see what, what their thoughts are on, on that. And then one thing that, um, this is me like wearing the, my, my day job is focused on helping kids get from high school to post-secondary life. And uh, a big part about our students' high school experience, the students that I work with, is the lack of career path exposure uh, and knowing what possibilities are available to you. High school happens really fast. And by the time you're halfway through high school, you get to a point where people are asking you, what are you majoring in? What does your personal statement say? And what colleges are you applying to? Or what career paths are you applying to? Um, and I feel like the first couple of years of high school, unless you know what you want to be when you grow up, are really difficult to frame that. I'm thinking about how we use our middle school time with our students to help with more career path exposure. Um, I'd love for us to assess that as a district, but I also love to get our high school peers counterpart uh, opinion on our students walking in with the tools that they need to be able to make the most out of their high school experience. Whereas like when I remember when I went to high school, I kind of blew my freshman year just kind of like getting my foothold, right? like getting, getting my bearings straight and did not take advantage of all the opportunities that were available to me in high school and kind of had to play catch up. Uh, and I was a relatively decent student and still felt like I was playing catch up. And so um, those are two things that came up for me that I'd love to just put a bug in your ear on and think about how do we bake that into or how do we address it or either choose not to address it as a district. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, Gina Zaccardi, who's my counterpart in District 99, is part of the Curriculum Council. So she was actually in one of the small groups that worked through and developed these categories. So from, from, from a, a, a one-person level, there's already input and awareness. But in terms of looking at the metrics that 99 is using to define ninth grade on track and, and seeing where those connections could be, uh, I think that's certainly something we can continue to, to explore in the next month or two. Uh, there is some degree of career awareness and, be, you know, beginning of, I, I don't know that it's specifically career path exploration, but there is some of that in, within different parts of the middle school curriculum. So, I, I mean, I think we can, that might be more over here in terms of a conversation, but I think we, I don't, you know, but we can certainly continue to look at and, and potentially expand some of the ways that we offer those things. And 20 years ago, it was, it was a, a, a program called The Real Game, and it was, you know, it was a, a five, six day student exploration of potential careers. And, you know, those things evolve over time. Our high school um, department chairs do often come over and talk about some of the electives that are available to freshmen uh, to our um, to our eighth grade students as well. Thanks. Anybody else? Right. I think I'm going to switch spots here. Okay. Okay, 
So the next step for a strategic plan, um, first I want to give an overview in, again, emphasize that District 58 is committed to following a strategic plan. The reason for this is it unites the district and allows all of us to move forward in the same direction. If a district doesn't have a strategic plan, what can happen is it, it starts to lose focus and direction and you can become the victim of a thousand great ideas. And, and so strategic planning really does help streamline everything and get everyone walking in the same direction. And the beauty of a strategic plan is it's community driven. It spans multiple years, past multiple board elections, and it really comes from the staff and the community and sets the direction for the school district. And a strategic plan should always be reviewed frequently. So for instance, we do that right now with our current strategic plan where we review that quarterly. Our plan that we currently have provides a lot of clarity and direction for the school district. It is one of the most extensive and thorough strategic plans I've ever read. And again, it is reviewed quarterly and really poured over by the district leadership team. So the current model that we have is the recipe for success as we want to move forward. Some history behind the current plan. This really started well before I arrived back in the district. So in, in 2016, 17, you had a meet and confer, and confer committee that started talking about this. It was kind of the precursor for our plan. The Board of Education engaged Hazard Young Atia in 1718. ECRA um, is also part of Hazard Young Atia, so they are familiar with our district. A framework was created in May of 2018. Subgroups then between May and August of 2018 really then started to write a lot of the detail that you see in the plan. You know, section 1B, C, 2.3, we, we sometimes kind of joke about that, but um, that's where a lot of that detail started to take place. So action steps were approved in the fall of school year 18-19. And the plan was intended to be a four-year plan. But when you look back, there was some conversation about should this be a four-year plan? Should this be a five-year plan? But the consensus really was around a four-year plan, although it was never technically voted on that this has to be four years or five years. But the consensus in, in going back and reading the minutes was, was clear that it was a, is about a four-year plan given how extensive and thorough and, and possibly then review it and talk about renewing, which is what we're doing now. As Justin shared, KPIs were written for four years. They expired um, in 2021. That 17, 18 year was the baseline year. So that's why there's such an emphasis on KPIs this year. Certainly COVID-19 has impacted the completion of goals and or sub goals. A uh, perfect example of that is goal three under facilities in our current plan. Um, that called for a potential referendum in November of 2020. Obviously that didn't happen because of the pandemic. And again, technically if you view this as a four year plan, it does expire at the end of this school year. Again, to just reiterate some of the things uh, that Justin talked about, we do have to review those and create new K KPIs this year. Uh, we are strongly recommending that that gets adopted in conjunction with the portrait of a graduate. Uh, several key groups will review these. The board will adopt the final version. So again, I want to emphasize that a lot of groups are giving feedback and having discussions, but certainly the KPIs fall under the realm of the Board of Education. We would be making a recommendation that the board would have the final say in what those KPIs are. And again, we're targeting March of 2022, which is this upcoming March. Okay, so options moving forward for the strategic plan. One option you always have is you can let the current plan expire and then you don't renew it. That would kind of go against everything I just talked about, the importance of a strategic plan. So certainly I don't believe anyone is recommending that we take that. The next one is to revamp the entire plan, including the KPIs. It's not that we don't think that that is a good idea. It's just, I wouldn't recommend that right now as your superintendent for some reasons that I'll get to in a second. The other option that you have, option three, if you want to call it, is extend the current plan for two years, post the expiration of this year, and renew the KPIs. Why would I recommend you take that course of action? That allows for key work in the current plan to be completed. So goal three is a great example of that with our facilities. There's a lot of unfinished business in the current plan due to COVID that we just haven't been able to get to, but certainly our community still called for that. But you also still have the ability to throw in new ideas and goals. So for instance, around curricular areas, 
we still have curriculum that needs to be implemented on the cycle that Justin has shared. You could also still have conversation about long-term vision goals, like full day kindergarten, if that's something that's interested. You can still pick that up. So just because you extend this doesn't mean that you can't still have conversations that could stem uh, from district leadership team and then make it all the way up to the board. But extending this really does, in my view, rec recognizes the current institutional capacity. There's a ton going on and we're recovering from the pandemic. If we're gonna embark on something like strategic planning, it is a very extensive process. And I'm not certain right now, despite everyone's best efforts, that we have the institutional capacity at the moment to take on another giant thing like this. I think we do have to recognize that. Another benefit of perhaps kicking it um, you know, another two years is it allows these new KPIs, Portrait of a Graduate, to really be tested and thoroughly reviewed to make sure that they are meeting what we're trying to do. I also believe that once we get a chance to go over goal three and determine whether or not we want to go to a potential referendum and perhaps have a vote, you're going to have much clearer direction in terms of what you need to do as a school district post November 22 once you know where you're at. So to, for the discussion for this particular piece, these are kind of one and the same, but is the board comfortable with pursuing an extension of the strategic plan for the next two school years? And is the board comfortable with embarking on a new strategic planning process during school year 23-24? So we wanted to throw those dates out there certainly as a conversation starter and then bring that back to the DLT. But if we could, let's have a discussion about where you're at as a board in, in terms of your comfort level with extending it and then does it make sense to extend for two years? Does it make sense to extend just maybe past the potential referendum? Where are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Kevin. Um, as somebody who went through the strategic plan last time, uh, it, it's an exciting process and a very thorough process, and I'm very proud of the work that, that, got, that got done with that. Um, there, there's one other aspect, though, too. I, one, I do support the idea of uh, doing an extension on our current plan, and I, I think you pointed out some really good reasons why. I think the other one is, um, we have a, while we have a couple things to finish up, I think it's also important that we sort of get out of the haze of sort of this trauma-based processing that we've been doing over this time to make sure that the vision that we're creating for either another four or five years is based on the long-term vision and not uh, sort of fighting the battles that we've been Mm -hmm. that we've been battling uh, during this time. Uh, I also just want to say in general, I, I support your timeline here in that if we're going to go through the process of building and creating new KPIs, uh, by doing this and providing a little bit of, of a timeline here, so using it for the, re the remainder then of this school year and then, and then for next school year, uh, I think what that provides us is the ability to see the effectiveness of those. I, I do worry that if if we just did something for a very short period of time, we may be preventing ourselves from getting the, the full set of data out of those to know if whether or not we want to build off those when we go into a new strategic plan or take that another route. So I, I think it is important to make sure that we do have, have an opportunity if we're gonna implement something new to be able to fully read and assess the, the value uh, that came out of that. Uh, so. I think, your, I think your timeline looks good here in general. And, uh, and to piggyback off of that, um, one of the members that Member Ellis was asking is, you know, how do these KPIs inform your decision making? I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but certainly with more data on key performance indicators, that is certainly relevant data that you can bring back to your community that can inform your next steps in the strategic planning process as well, especially around curriculum, social emotional learning, and academic learning as well. Yeah, especially with, I mean, with, we've made a tremendous amount of change in the curricula materials that we, over the last couple of years, and we're still in the process of doing that. So it would be nice to, I think, get over uh, that hump as well. But open up the discussion to the, uh, the full board. I, I support it also. I, I, you know, I wasn't here for the prior strategic planning process. I do think three-year strategic plans are excellent uh, frameworks. But given that we're addressing educational gaps, we're addressing um, instructional gaps, we're, we're addressing a lot this year now, 
to try to bring our kiddos back to where they need to be. Oh, I said your word, kiddos. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, you're really not hard. Um, but to bring, you know, the focus, uh, and I think it's the appropriate focus for teachers and staff and administration is on the students right now and bringing them to where they need to be. And I think, you know, we don't lose sight of the strategic plan in this process, and it kind of keeps that arrow pointed where it needs to be pointed right now. Um, and I like the time frames too. I like the idea that it's really finish out this year, take the next year to kind of finalize where we are with the KPIs that come through in March, and then go into strategic planning 2023, renewed, refreshed, and capable of handling that, I think, is really important. I also support, I think it's, a, um, like you talked about, I think there's a lot of sort of um, aspects of the old strategic plan that we haven't quite gotten to the finish line yet for a lot of reasons. And I think it's, those are all really important things that we need to continue to focus on. And so I think it's good to keep, kind of keep that going until we can, we can achieve those goals. And I also think we have a couple things coming up that can really help us, and correct me if I'm wrong on, if I'm not thinking about this correctly, but I think we have a couple opportunities for a lot of community feedback the next year with the Citizens Task Force and the all of the focus groups around the equity audit and things like that where we're going to get a lot of feedback from the community about how we're doing as a district what we need and want as a district and things like that and that can help us then to um build the next strategic plan after we kind of complete some of these other these other previous goals and so i think we're going to get a lot of help in, in getting us driving in the right direction for the next strategic plan with all that feedback without having to kind of go through the whole lengthy process um, again while still having those things hanging over our so. I, I think you're exactly right, and I also think that directly ties into what I was referring to about institutional capacity. We are clearly uh -huh. um, embarking on a public engagement, mm -hmm. um, you know, outreach to our community to see does the community want us to move forward with a potential referendum based on all the facility needs. In order to do that process with fidelity, which is a huge task. You can't also then engage in a strategic planning process mm -hmm. in my view. I just think it's too challenging mm -hmm. to do both. And I think the first will certainly inform the latter. And so I, I agree with everything that you said and the feedback that we're going to get with what we're currently doing and a public information uh, program is certainly gonna help inform a future strategic plan. Okay. I'm comfortable also with it for many of the reasons that's going be redundant to say. <laughs> Clint, do you have anything? Otherwise, I'm good. Uh, I don't, don't uh, agree with mostly everything that's been shared. Uh, one of the things that we'll know a lot more, if we do decide to go for a referendum, we will know in November of 2022 which way the community has voted. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I'd, I'd like to at least leave on the table for us as a board depending on the outcome in the event that the outcome one if we choose to go for a vote and the outcome is a yes uh, i'd love to kick start the uh, the strategic planning process directly following it uh, or at least put on the table as a board to consider using the second half of the next school year to do strategic planning um i don't see a, a, a i don't see a convincing reason in this moment to wait in the event that we have a uh, directive from the community at that time um because uh we will i think put to bed one of the biggest parts of our previous strategic plan at that point uh, to start to operate and uh, execute against it. Um, but uh, we don't know the, we don't know whether we will go to the community for that type of a vote and what we don't know what the outcome will be at this time. And so uh, I, I appreciate the recommendation as it stands today. I just want to leave open for us as a board. Uh, we will learn a lot in the next 12 months and in those 12 months our opinions might change and so I'd love to at least from one person's perspective provide the direction of um, I might want to revisit this in uh, November of next year. And I, I think that is perfectly fair and, and uh, perfectly reasonable as we move forward. You know, a lot can change in 12 months as we've certainly learned that over the last two and a half years. And if all those things were to fall perfectly into place, I do think you'd be in a position where, okay, now it's time to take that next step and let's define it. Um, if they don't fall perfectly into place, you may have different decisions which would line up perfectly with this recommendation. And, and, and this is really a recommendation might be too strong of a word it, it's direction to keep the conversation going certainly the conversation is not closed if things get taken care of earlier 
then obviously we know what the next step is here and would certainly entertain uh, moving that forward. One thing I will say is, is while that timeline, while that looks far out to me, um, it's probably going to be here. Far out, like in the 1970s version yeah. of Far Out. <laughs> Super cool, right? Super cool. Uh, yeah. Um, while while it does while it does look off into the future, I, I think it'll come much quicker than we think it does. However, I know that the DLT is meeting at least quarterly, and if, if some of the stuff goes down, you may need to meet more often than that. And at some point, if we start getting into the next fiscal year, and we're saying, all right, we sort of locked in on these KPIs. We need more information. We're ready to move on. I, I, I think that at any point, if, 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 the, if coming out of your committee is, hey, we make a recommendation, we start executing quicker, I think that's a great opportunity for us to have a dialogue. Um, we may also find that we're still in the middle of mm -hmm. making sure our KPIs are functioning and working. And even though goal three all of a sudden now is, is fully on the tracks, we may want to to fully flush out a little bit more of the, the KPI and the portrait of a graduate prior to going to the community so we have a good baseline to start sure. from and then this timeline might work out. I, I Predicting exactly what next year, you know, a year from now is gonna look like is, you know, I, I forgot my crystal ball so I, I, I can't <laughs> do it right now but if, I, if, if we are in a great place next year, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation. I'm just trying to make sure that we're actually building ourselves a solid foundation and I think, I think this is it for right now anyway. And the one thing, um, you know, given my experience with planning uh, strategic plan is, and I know that sounds kind of funny, but you do have to take the time to plan what would this process look like. Yeah. I think a, a very ambitious strategic planning process can be done in about six months. Um, six months to a year is more kind of that sweet spot that you would need, given the level of community involvement that, um, you know, our stakeholders expect and, and deserve. Uh, six months would be about as quick of a time frame, I think, as you can get. But certainly, if you had a lot of those answers in November of 22, you know, six months down the road, you could be in a place where you can implement something in, in 2023-24. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is now an opportunity of members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. I will do a, I, I do have one card right now, uh, but a last call for cards if there's anybody else that would like to make a comment uh, tonight. Uh, Colleen McLaughlin from the Leicester Attendance Area. Thank you for your patience today. Oh, okay. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I have to wear these, sorry. Um, so my name's Colleen McLaughlin. Uh, I'm a parent of two boys who attend Leicester Elementary School. My oldest son is Parker, he's in fifth grade. And my youngest son is Rory and he is in first grade. Um, I realize that what I'm going to say tonight, I can send an email to you, um, but I felt it was important that I came and said it to you so that you could hear the emotion in my voice as well as maybe the emotion of my eyes behind my mask. <laughs> um, our District 58 experience <clears throat> has been all positive. Um, while we're engaged parents, we have not been uh, very much on-site parents due to the demands of our job. This changed significantly on March 16th when our youngest son, Rory, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. At that time, Rory was a Lester kindergartner attending Pierce Downer. After the chaos of learning and accepting Rory's diagnosis, we were welcomed back to Pierce by a wonderful team. Uh, Michelle Shannon is the head nurse. Um, Jen Jackson is the school nurse. Um, Kathy Yee was Rory's teacher. And then the two secretaries at Pierce, Heather and Angela, um, were just very, very welcoming back to us. Rory was only in school for about two and a half hours a day at that time. And Jen, the nurse, and I would be in contact several times throughout those two and a half hours trying to manage Rory's numbers. And when I say numbers, I'm talking about his blood glucose levels. Um, he spent a significant time in the office as we struggled to get a grip on this really difficult disease. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about what type 1 diabetes is, but I will tell you that managing it is a 24-hour-a-day effort. 
Needless to say, going into this school year, I was beyond anxious. Rory's numbers were a full-on roller coaster of the entire summer, and the thought of handing him over to the school for seven hours a day, five days a week, now including a meal that he would require an insulin injection for, was just seemed absolutely impossible to me. I know type 1 diabetics have gone through District 58 probably since it started, but this was my child that I managed all summer and I could not wrap my head around how he would be managed all while he trying to get a proper education. I was contacted in early August by Katie Novosel, the Lester principal, to set up Rory's 504 meeting. On the call was Sue Donahue, the head nurse at, at Lester, um, Laura Novotny, who was Rory's first grade teacher, and Karen Scarpelli, the Lester nurse. What a team. They could not have been more prepared, supportive, and welcoming to Rory and I. So let's fast forward to Rory starting school, and well, let's just say it's been a ride. So much so that I felt compelled to come here tonight and make you aware of the most amazing people who have taken on this monster of a disease and gone above and beyond for our family. I don't have the proper words to express how much Karen Scarpelli has done for Rory. She is an earth angel. As you all know, Lester is a big school. Karen has made me feel like Rory is her number one priority, all while managing the medical care for hundreds of students amid a worldwide pandemic. Laura Novotny and her teacher's aide, Melissa Hirboth, have done everything they can to manage Rory's numbers as best they can in the classroom so that he does not miss valuable instruction in the class. Taylor Sopran is the Wilshire PE teacher. She's 100% on top of him to ensure that he remains stable during exercise in PE class. I debated whether or not I was going to mention this, but Taylor is my first cousin. I did not want that to take away from the job <laughs> and her job in place of employment. <laughs> so I came here tonight for three reasons. Number one, November is National Diabetes Awareness Month, and I thought it was a perfect time to bring this positive experience to your attention. Rory is currently the only type 1 diabetic at Leicester, which is crazy. Um, November is also a month that we take time to express gratitude. It's important to me that the people at the top of the school district know and are aware of a District 58 family who is beyond grateful for the people who compassionately care for our children on a daily basis. This world can be filled with so much negativity, even so much over the last year and a half, and particularly in schools. <laughs> I'm politely asking you, that if your responsibilities happen to put you in front of any of the following people, you let them know that you've been made aware of a family who is beyond grateful for their work in District 58. That would be Katie Novosel, the Lester principal, Sue Donahue, the nurse, Laura Novotny, Roy's first grade teacher, Taylor Sobran, the PE teacher, and last but most importantly, Karen Scarpelli, the Lester school nurse. Her care, compassion, concern, and diligence has made this mom of a child with medical needs easier on a daily basis. Thank you so much for your time. I genuinely appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank thank you for sharing the story. story. I think I got all those names. I got them all. <laughs> <laughs> a little help from Greg. <laughs> I shouldn't be being over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Next up is going to be our approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 13th, 2021 regular meeting as presented? So move. Second. All right. Um, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Uh, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 13th, 2021 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 20th, 2021 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 20th, 2021 meeting as presented is there a motion to approve the minutes of the october 25th 2021 curriculum workshop as presented so moved second all right melissa please call roll member weiner aye member doshi aye 
Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 25th, 2021 curriculum workshop as presented. We have a consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? Yes, Mr. Hughes, I'd like to vote separately on item C number five. Okay. I'll do the same on item C number 23. Okay. Any others? All right, then is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills in summary and the, and the IA, IASB resolutions minus resolution okay. number five and number 23, number five, hold on. Number five is the remote virtual school board open meetings. And number three, and number 23 is the physical and mental health of students. So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Number Weiner. Aye. Number Doshi. Aye. Number Ellis. Aye. I'm gonna need him again. Number Hannes. Aye. Number Harris. Aye. Number Hughes. Aye. The motion carried uh, to approve the consent agenda uh, consisting of the personnel report and financial statements uh, and the, the list of bills in summary and the IASB resolutions minus resolution number five, remote and virtual school board open meetings and number 23, physical and mental health of students. We will now consider IASB resolution number five. Is there a motion to adopt or uh, yeah. Is there a motion to adopt this resolution? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? So just a, a quick recap of what I said um, earlier in the meeting. Um, I firmly believe that in an emergency, we need some. It would be good to have language quite like this, but this is not spelled out in the resolution, um, and that gives me the great concern that this is the opposite of transparency um, when you have a a a, a, a video meeting i don't think that's even close to the consistent with the open the spirit of the open meetings act and um, i think it's um you know we, we talk a lot as a board when we uh, evaluate ourselves about how we better engage our community i don't think um, having having the opportunity to um evade the community i mean i, I know that we wouldn't do that but that just uh, this allows for the, that kind of abuse is, is is consistent with our beliefs this so just because so isb says to adopt it it's going to go before whether, whether we're we adopt whether we support it or not it'll get voted on through the the delegates correct right and if it does pass it's just a resol it's just a thing right like it doesn't mean that we're held to it like we can as a board decide that we don't want well, to do that we don't right? know if it's a state law that requires us to allow for that then we may be required to allow for anybody at any time to but our, our casting a vote in support of this does not mean that it is happening. It means that we're telling the lobbying arm of the ISB to um, advocate for it, to yeah. push their legislator, the legislators in that direction. It doesn't mean that by us saying, yes, we support this, it's, it, is, it exists. We're saying we want to um, tell our legislators to advocate for it. Um, that's correct. And the resolution, what it's saying is, uh, be it resolved that the Illinois Association of School Boards so urge the Illinois General Assembly to mm -hmm. pass legislation to allow school boards and committees, you know, right. blah, 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 as we've discussed before. And, and Tracy, you inadvertently, I don't know if you meant to do this, but you, you came up with a really good point that I would just like to mention that you brought up. I mean, we don't, it, there's no local control on this. In theory, again, I know I'm being very cynical here, and that's and I and I know I'm I'm not just talking about 58 because I think this is a great board. I'm just talking about all districts statewide. In theory, the, the the school district doesn't have any control about well, the policy. So you could have a member who decided to be remote tonight because he wanted to watch the Bears game on his couch with his laptop in his in his in his lap and and the, the, the TV on. I don't just think that's. I, again, I, I know, I, I'm gonna repeat myself, I'm being very cynical. I just don't think that that is consistent with, with the, the spirit of, of OMA and what we've held ourselves to as a board and why we got into this. And, and I just, um, just the lack of, of structure on this is just, I think it needs to be, like we talked about with, with number 20, I think it just needs to be go, go back to the drawing board and come up with something stronger next year. Yeah. So, not to be cynical, 
It's okay. But, I already broke. But but <laughs> but but they're saying to adapt it, and whether if we say we don't support it, it's it's possible it's going to pass anyway. Correct. 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 Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. It is possible it'll pass anyway, and then but because if IASB is saying they support it, then. Right, the, so odds, are in, the odds are in favor that this would pass right. because so, it's okay. the recommendation. I was going to say, what is the historical precedent, Karat? You might know more. You the historical precedent is that it's really rare for, a, what, 178 delegates, I think, believe that, believe that end up voting typically for it to not pass if it's to the recommendation. Against, it, to but against, but it, had, it has happened before. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has happened a few times before, so okay. every year there's always a few that were recommended, and the majority of the delegates go in the opposite direction. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, at, at certain points when they go advocate for something, I think, I think when you have dissent in there as well, that that still sends a message. So yep. even if we think something's going to pass, yeah. it doesn't mean that we can't uh, potentially oh, stand yeah. up against it. Still vote. I and mean, we have a handful of ones tonight that we are going against the ISB recommendation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Any more discussion on that? Um, just to note that I disagree that it goes against the tenor of the OMA. Um, you know, they act very near and dear to my heart um, because it clearly uh, dresses out each item in the OMA, including providing notice to the public, including providing ability to the public to engage with uh, members of the board, including, so I don't understand where the transparency is an issue here. Uh, I think that it would still allow for, otherwise all of the COVID meetings would have had no impact on the community whatsoever, and I think we saw very clearly that it had quite an impact on the community. I don't disagree that in-person is better. I think I 100% agree that presence on a board is very important, and being physically in person is very important on a board, uh, but I disagree with your analysis on it. If we, there, I don't. Want, I'm not. Just really a difference of opinion. No, I understand that. But I'm. What I'm saying is, if if we we, we I I was here for every board meeting that we had during COVID. Well, not, maybe not everyone. I think I did miss one for vacation. No, no I think I did participate because I was allowed to. Um, it was a completely different experience. We had people calling in, and 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 leaving uh, leaving voicemails for us that we would listen to. And that experience for me as a board member was extremely subpar. I couldn't, first of all, I couldn't even hear them half the time, especially this, this, this room was pretty good, but when we were in, in some of like in Herrick in the, in the, in the gymnasium, uh, couldn't hear, not the, whatever, uh, couldn't hear anything they were saying. It is not the same to, to hear like Mrs. McLaughlin, to hear, have that conversation with her right in front of us. That conversation is entirely different when, when the six of us are sitting right here than it would be if she just called in. Um, that's why she didn't leave us a, that's why she didn't write us an email. She wanted to come and she wanted to address this Board of Education. So I think that that's important. I think that's, that, that is our, our commitment to the community to be here and to be listening to them. And I, it's not even close to the same thing when, when, when we, uh, like I said, a year ago when people were calling us. And I agree with all of those things that you just said. I just don't agree with your analysis of the OMA. I agree with, and I agree piece. with that too. I think in person is obvious. I think we all would agree that in person, we've, mm -hmm. we are better bored when we're in person for sure, when we're able to have a full meeting, when everyone's here. But I also think, to your point, Greg, about, about someone being able to come and speak. And yes, having her be able to come and stand in front of us and speak was, was much more powerful than if she were to be reading that over the phone to us. But there are some people who cannot come to a meeting. They're not able to. For whatever reason, a million reasons, they can't come. I mean, we've seen that, that we don't have very many people coming and actively participating in our meetings. And if you look back to during COVID when there was um, the option to make remote comments or um, just other options for participating remotely, we, we might have had higher participation in those times because more people are able, it's, it's easier to participate from home in that, in that way. Now for us board members, yeah, that's a little bit different. I'm not, certainly not advocating to say that people should just on a whim decide, oh, I don't really feel like going tonight, so I'm gonna participate from home. I don't think, like you said, that's not the precedent that we have as a board. And I don't think that allowing this emergency exception is gonna change that necessarily. I don't see that happening. I understand what you're saying we are this board and we could be making decisions for a board that's here 10 years from now and we don't know who those people are going to be or what their attitudes are going to be that's hard but i think we also have to make a decision in some ways for now and say for right now maybe this is something that having this as an option could be potentially useful should we need it but not just 
oh, let's just have there's, emergency. There's no yeah. local control on this is the way they've worded it. We've handed off local control, so there is no, we can decide if we want to use it. If half the board just doesn't want to physically be here, that would be allowed under the way that it's worded. Today. I understand, but so you could also I'm say there's no local control on the other end of it too. You could also say when you right, have rules that say you have to have a quorum, that takes away local control too. But it's, so it's it, but that's been away for 100 yeah. years for us to stand really to sit in front. Of, yeah, we've been tasked with sitting in front of our community and having to be here. This is taking away local control on the exact opposite spectrum that could take high functioning boards and make them very low functioning boards or allow things to happen quite quickly and sort of I yes it may meet OMA technically but to be able to push something through like a more controversial vote where we have to sit in front of people like when we when we were looking to sell Longfellow when we were looking to reopen our schools I think it benefited us to be there you're right we did have a lot of participation during some of these COVID conversations but it wasn't because we were remote it was because everybody's kids were so greatly impacted. We had 1,500 people watching on some of those meetings live. We, uh, our peak number tonight was 16. Um, sure. You know, and, and they can still watch 15, remotely. We would have never had 1,500 people no. here in person. But, 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 but this but doesn't do anything to encourage more community participation. We're still, we don't have to do it. I mean, we're still streaming this video live and we will yeah. continue to do that. This, uh, this, this resolution doesn't change the fact that sure. 1,500 people could watch this at home or 1,500 people can um, watch it a week from now. Then sure. email that, us that, and everything else. That doesn't yeah. impact no, us at all. You're right. Uh, yeah, and, but I mean, to your point on the, on the you know, quick votes, and, I mean, you still have to provide appropriate notice via the media and the public and how sure. to access and all of that. So the same thing as when we have any emergency meeting where we have to meet very quickly to do a, a, an emergency vote. It's the same kind of thing. So it would be the same kind of notice because you still would have to follow the OMA. It, you can't it, change that absolutely, law. They're can. not gonna change that, that what the appropriate notice definition is. You're absolutely right, but there's a completely different impact than if, uh, if, if, I, if I spin a, up a meeting and I do it all remotely and we just have to listen to some comments remotely or read emails. Uh, sometimes it just has a different impact than when, when we have to face our, our community in, right. in person. I don't see any guardrails in here or any aspects for local control. This district has a history of advocating for local control whenever possible. And so for that reason, I can't and, support it. You know, Darren, I forgot that we used that for several meetings, you were reading messages to us before we even had yeah. the voicemails. And those were hot, contentious meetings. And you were probably reading those things for at, 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 the, at the height, probably like for 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And that would have been just the, 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 the the feeling of that, I mean, it's, it's, it, we're not hearing, we're, we're hearing somebody's passion coming through you and, and, and you're not really conveying that to us. I think that's that with a lot of those people who were very upset about X, Y, and Z during those meetings, that was completely lost because we were all at home and we only had, had the opportunity to hear from our stakeholders through you. I agree. Wait, so, so so this also says that people can just leave a comment? We have to have a telephone line? I don't think oh. it says that. So I don't think they haven't defined it yet. It's okay if we're not here. It, uh, well, it does say that there has to be um, certain personnel are present at the posted meeting location. So you do still have to have a meeting location. Sure. So Melissa, Darren, and Kevin maybe at, at a bare minimum. That's, that's what it was like before. I, mean, I was going to say we did that a couple times, yeah, like mm -hmm. during the COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comments? No. All right, well, let's please call just, roll. Just to make sure we know how this vote works. I was going to say, can we clarify? <laughs> We're voting to adopt. Right, so you would be I if you agree with the resolution as stated, you would be a nay if you disagree with the resolution as right. stated. Okay. In this case. Okay. Right, and I need Thank four you. votes for it Thank to you pass, correct? correct? Yes. To adopt, we need four votes. Yes, because there's only six. Okay, let's please go roll. All right, um, Member Weiner. Nay. Member Doshi? Nay. Member Ellis? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Nay. And Member Hughes? Nay. Uh, the, the motion failed um, on IESB resolution number five, remote virtual school board open meetings. Next up, is there a motion to approve? Or I'm sorry, is this one, was it recommended to adopt or not adopt? Okay. This is, right, same, this is the same thing. Recommended to this adopt. one's up. This one's going to be the opposite, though. So, uh, oh, so right. we will now consider 
ISB resolution number 23, the physical and mental health of students. Is there a motion to not adopt this resolution? So I see, because we because the committee recommended to not right. adopt, so we're voting on that. Correct. That's Thank so you. So if you vote aye on this, it would be to not adopt it. If you vote nay on it, it would be to adopt it. Yep. Okay. You got it. Yep. <laughs> I will say that one more time. I'm sorry. The recommendation is to not adopt. So the recommendation vote from the legislative from committee. From the committee. Yes, Correct. From our committee. So yes. the recommendation from our committee is to not adopt. Yes. So a yay vote would be to not adopt it. Okay. A nay vote would be to adopt it. So it's backwards. It's the opposite from, of what we just did. Right. right. It's the opposite of what we just exactly. did. Exactly. Okay. Correct. I don't have a second. I have a second. Okay. Uh, discussion. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of uh, why I will vote nay in this case, I believe. Is that right? That's yes, right. you nay, will vote nay. nay to adopt. Yes. You don't tell me how I'll no, vote. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need to listen to you because if I agree with you, I know how to vote. That's right. <laughs> I'm being facetious, as usual. Um, this is a belief statement, not a resolution. Uh, this is a belief statement that the main change here, not so much the committee's rationale or anything else, the change here is on physical and mental health. That's all that changes. And that's all that we're suggesting that it gets changed here. Um, uh, uh, let me correct myself. And uh, what changes is that dental and physical examinations for their children, uh, for children, in addition to, vis in addition to vision. Uh, I don't disagree with any of those things. Uh, I believe those are things that we, as, we should advocate for as a district, for our lobbying body to also believe. Uh, I believe this will take a significant step forward if, uh, you know, if, if journalists are writing headlines for what comes out of delegate assembly, I hope that they say the districts across the state have approved that mental health is just as important as physical health by changing this belief statement. Whether they'll write those headlines or not, probably not because of the, because of the firearms question that's all, also up for debate. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I, uh, this is this is a space where sitting here in 2021, looking back on the work that we do together in moving this district forward and moving education forward, it, if, it feels silly to me that we wouldn't name mental health to be mm -hmm. just on the same par as a belief with physical health. Yeah. I'm in 100% agreement on the belief statement itself. I have a question yeah. um, that Kevin or you might be able to answer because you've done this before, right? Uh, have you? you have have. Okay. Uh, the legislative committee, not just like this thing. Um, are these rationales printed with the belief statement when they change the belief statement, or no. are they just here? Sorry, I let you finish. Yeah, or are they just here? Go ahead. They are. Uh, the belief statements stand on their own. The rationale is just for supporting for the vote. The belief statements stand on their own. Yes, I, I would concur. So we don't print them together. Right. Once it's the only vote is made, only the belief statement would be there. Okay. Okay. However, yeah. the rationale could be part of what goes into their process of advocating. You know, right, once they get down there and they start having discussion with the legislature, um, you know, the General Assembly in general, um, that's where some of that, like understanding where their thought process behind that was, sure. I, I, that's, why, that, that's why that aspect of, I think is a little bit uh, important. Yeah. The Declaration of Independence is like a belief statement. That it's a right. Little also <laughs> so I, I, I just want to make sure that where i'm voting on this i'm voting on the belief statement i'm not voting on the rationale mm -hmm. because i really disagree with the rationale for the reasons that we prior stated because there isn't as much access to that kind of health care for everybody so it creates an inequity and i don't like creating inequities so i have an issue with the rationale i have zero issue with the belief statement itself Pratt, can you speak a little bit to like the difference between a resolution and a belief statement? Why did they designate those things differently? Do you know? I do not know why they designate them differently. Okay. Uh, I believe, <laughs> not for intended, I believe a belief statement is really for like what do we value as an IASB? Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't get into like what they go to lobby for on behalf of the state bo or school boards to uh, in Springfield because it's not yet a resolution. Okay. So it's really just a like core values of the school district, right? As it as, it a, as a parallel or analogy here. Okay. Uh, it's what we what we say we believe in as a school district is the same thing as what the IASB says that they believe in as a uh, a body of school boards. 
Okay. The, the belief statement, too, really gives a green light for the IESB staff to go out there and, and um, advocate, put in their literature, make part of their professional development. It also gives local boards the ability to say, the Illinois Association of School Boards is fully behind if we wanted to take action on, you know, mental health or something like that. Uh -huh. So it's, it's very empowering for its members and the staff of ISB to go out there and really push for that particular change. Okay. It's a little bit different than lobbying, but certainly lobbying would be included in that where the other resolutions are more district specific that IASB is saying, okay, you know, Champaign School District or Wilmington School District, we'll go out there and, and also support that. This really boils down to the core beliefs of the IASB and what that organization is going to say they're all about. Okay. Would this give um, IASB more uh, incentive potentially to work with public health departments around mental health and creating access? Potentially, not. I'm not asking you to make a like dead on statement on potentially, it. Potentially, does yes. that tend to happen? If it's in a belief statement, they'll forge forward and maybe work with other areas. Um, and other SMEs that are working in this area, or subject matter experts that are working in these areas that impact children. I think that's exactly right. You had said something earlier about it's kind of like your mission and your vision for a school district. So once we adopt a mission and a vision, it's a driving we're all, it drives every decision that we make, drives our actions, drives what we you know are out there sharing with the community. Mm -hmm. Very similar here to a belief statement. And again, the way I would delineate some of these resolutions is the belief statement is all for IASB, what they believe is an organization, where the resolutions are, they're supporting another district's vision for a specific topic of what they'd like to see happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So if we were voting yay, that means we are supporting yes, not, adopt, not yeah. adopt. Right. right. So now so this is resolution May, number 23. Right physical and mental health of students. The motion is to not adopt the resolution. So a vote, an I vote would give you do not adopt. A nay vote would be to adopt the resolution since the recommendation is to not adopt. Um, can I hear from, I, I guess, um, Mr. Hughes or Mr. or Dr. Russell uh, or somebody else who spoke earlier. I, I just, um, I'd like to understand a little bit about the rest the um, I know you said it pretty well Kevin about the um, like the reason why you recommended not adopting um, this I just I mean I, I'm a little bit yeah I, I'm a little lost in this one, I so think I don't really I'm still on the fence trying to figure this one out when we sit in these discussions with with our community groups we really have a hard time separating the rationale from the mm -hmm. belief statement or the resolution because I think that gives us a good indication of where they may be going. I am 1,000% on board as the superintendent in my recommendation, um, you know, supporting mental health on the same level as physical health. What I think we started to get concerned with was when you were looking at the district rationale of Glen Ellen 41 here, what I was concerned with, okay, if they put this in, and this is now another requirement for families on top of vision, on top of dental, on top of physical. Knowing that mental health is not supported by insurance plans in the same way that vision and dental and, and some of those others are, that we could be inadvertently putting an unduly burden or you know a cost onto families. As I shared before though, mm -hmm. in all fairness, that could be going too far if, if mm -hmm. it were just at a belief statement. But that was my worry behind that. Not that I don't believe that mental health is not important or it's on the same level as physical health. I do. I was worried about the rationale they provided because they used that word examination. And that's what really kind of threw us up. And like so many of these things, and Memorella has pointed this out, I, I wish we could have sat down with the people who said, or who wrote these resolutions or, or these belief statements that okay, well, if you just change this, it would fit yeah. perfectly. And that, or the that's rationale the committees, because uh, yeah. the one that there's the district rationale, which I'm actually not terribly against that either. But then it's the resolutions committees rationale that talks about examinations, and that's where I feel like you could create an inequity. Um, but the district rationale is in alignment with the belief statement, so it's just 
I don't like when things don't match. <laughs> yeah, to me, that gave me a, I, where my concern came from is, is not generally in, in the belief statement, but where the mindset came in for the people that are actually going to go be advocating for this. And I have a hard time understanding what the impact, if they start using influence here in their role in this, what does that lead to? And is it something that is good for our community and good? I, if this was just a, a more generic statement and didn't have some of those things, maybe we'd be having a different conversation. Um, and this may pass or it may not, but if it, if it, if it does, fine. If it doesn't, maybe they can come back and provide a little bit more clarity on, on their statement uh, at, a few, at a future time. I, I think is. Uh, but again, but I think I'm, I'm hung up on, the, on kind of the same component that, yeah. that you're hung up on. But to Member Doshi's point, the other thing that I talked about in the committee meeting was these are the kinds of things that drive change in places like insurance companies, mm -hmm. right? You, you create uh, an entire state of school districts that are requiring this now. Um, then everything starts to work together to make that change happen. Mm -hmm. But again, it's just my brain was just, it's not, it's not lining up how it says it is. I 100% believe in this belief, believe in this belief statement, darn it. I 100% <laughs> agree with this belief statement. I really don't like the rationale because it doesn't, I don't know what it, what it will wind up doing. So uh, and creating for people as a difficulty for those who don't have access to mental health care. Let's, let's play that scenario out in the state, in, in our state. Sure. Uh, that sounds fun. Well, I, I think the dark picture that you're painting of medical requirements put, being put on families that don't follow with a plan for how to execute it uh, doesn't jive with what I've seen in, from like from medical expectations of students sure. in previous record, right? When we think about educational mandates that are unfunded, different story, like 180 degree almost. When we talk about medical requirements for physical exams, for vision exams, uh, the insurance for those has followed. Public health clinics that's have what followed I'm first. I'm, that, I'm so that, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm not doing the dark picture. I'm doing that that is where it could wind up going, which I support right, that. Right, so the, that's where it could wind up going. I, I don't see the dark scenario of, well, now all parents must provide mental health screenings of students and there's no medical ba medical backing to provide for it. I, that is not a scenario that I, I worry about because there isn't, a, there isn't a precedent set in this realm that that backs that up so that's why i'm even more confident in voting nay on this on this particular vote well this is where i wish i had the public health department's input on this as well yeah. so that i knew are they doing similar are they following this suit of trying to get this forward but that is what it is uh, member hannes um, could you just again just summarize briefly the um the committee's feeling about this resolution and in terms and especially if there's uh anything that you know um, to, to add on to what Dr. Russell answered. I, I think he said it pretty concisely. I think the committee as a whole, again, supported the philosophy behind, but felt that there was, it was lacking in some of the follow through in the details in terms of execution. Um, should things like um, examinations be required if this belief statement became more of like a resolution style? And and to, to back that up, though, a belief statement wouldn't usually act, include realm of how you would execute against uh -huh. that belief statement, right? Because it would then get to a resolution point, right? So and so this would really just open the door for districts to then recommend how would we recommend a resolution that backs this belief statement. Uh, but that is the door that I can see it opening. But we wouldn't expect execution steps in a belief From statement. This. No, yeah, and, just and, this. And again, completely agree. Mm -hmm. I think that again that rationale is what opened that door in the committee's Discussion. but again I I will speak for the committee here the idea of placing mental health on the same level as physical health I don't think anybody disputed that exactly. in so if you're truly just voting on the belief concept here I don't think the committee would feel like you're overriding them or anything like that I, I just think the next step is something that you would have to watch out for and, and make sure it gets clearly outlined and laid forward or, or put forward by the um, ISB. There's clearly a, a call in there in the rationale for examinations on this. Um, 
and without sort of a clear vision on exactly where that goes, I, that's not something at this, I mean, the belief statement is one thing and I understand what we're saying, but I, the, I mean, they clearly wrote that down in the rationale and I think at this point, saying that I would advocate or anything for required examinations, I think would be something that before I could advocate for anything like that, that would, I'd have to engage the community further. I, we've already heard concerns along the lines of us capturing mental health data and even social emotional learning data. Um, we've, we've, over the last year and a half, we've heard a lot from that. I think that I can't be ready to start advocating for something where they're talking about that as being their goal. I really feel like that would be something that I'd wanna engage further with the community before I started advocating for that, so. But I think, I don't think there's a person on this board and my guess is it sounds like that committee that doesn't understand the value of being able to uh, help and work with, with students that need help when it comes to mental health, just as we do with physical health. So, any other comments, concerns, questions? All right, I will restate the resolution. It is to, we are voting on IASB resolution number 23. Can you bring up the mm -hmm. description again? The physical and mental health of students. The recommendation is to not adopt. So, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Nay. Member Ellis. Nay. Member Hannes. Nay. Member Harris. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. <laughs> so, so that means we abstain during the vote, right? Member, member McHennis does not doesn't cast a vote in either direction. Is that correct? Do no. you know? I'm not sure. Yeah. We, have when, to, we can inquire. For him. Typically, when there is a tie, and we can double check with our council, when there is a tie, the status quo remains. And so here, but but again, there's no previous board vote, so this is an interesting um, phenomenon. But but typically, when you have a tie, it remains status quo as is so you could interpret that as it right now it, the committee said do not adopt um, but again I, I think what we would want to do is to confer with council and just make sure that we're reading this right okay so is like the committee's vote considered the status quo is the question that I guess I don't I, I guess I well yeah. we'll see what council says but I don't see how the committee's vote could they're not an elected body. No, correct. I, I, I'm not disagreeing. So they, with their, what their you're opinion, they can't yeah. advocate on behalf of the district. So in a well, deadlock, we, can't, we, we cannot. We can't. We have not authorized Emily to take a position on this. Gotcha. This board of education. Gotcha. Correct. That feels right. That I would concur with that. Mm -hmm. I know you'll Karat, have you have you heard people abstain? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because to Member Harris's point, you do not have clear direction one way or the other. You have a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. therefore, this is a little different situation um, than if you're voting on, let's say, one-to-one -one iPads or something yeah. like that. Um, the committee yeah. simply gives a recommendation yeah. that is not to carry the weight of the board. I mean, we won't have a meeting in between Correct. now and then with Steve yeah. to re-vote on so this. So we will confer with council just to make sure we're, we're interpreting correctly, and then we will get back. Okay. okay. All right, our first recommendation for action is the 2021 American Education, Education Week Resolution. That's in here. I have a resolution to read here. Um, whereas the public schools are an important and integral part of society, and whereas the concept of a free and equal education is an American tradition and this country's strength, and whereas the students of today are the leaders of tomorrow, and whereas all citizens have a responsibility to support the public schools, now therefore be it resolved that we, the Board of Education, the Downers Grove Grade School District 58, DuPage County, Illinois, hereby proclaim November 15th through the 19th, 2021, American Education Week, and urge all citizens to make a commitment to the public education, to the future of our community, state, and nation by visiting their local public schools and by donating their time and talents to help make the public schools even better. It'll be dated today, uh, the eighth day of November, 2021. Is there a motion to adopt the American Education Week resolution as presented? So moved. Second. 
All right, well, uh, any discussion? Just don't visit unless you have approval to visit. <laughs> Pandemic withstanding. <laughs> All right, Melissa, please come. Roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the American Education Week resolution as presented. Next up is the 2020 Certificate of Levy. Is there a motion yeah. to adopt the 2021 Certificate of Levy in the amount of $62,610,000? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. Uh, to adopt the 2021 certificate of levy in the amount of $62,610,000. Uh, we have some surplus equipment, some HP printers. Is there a motion to designate a surplus, for, a surplus 14 HP printers? So move. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate as surplus 14 HP printers. Uh, you want to bring up the calendar change? Mm -hmm. you have any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we have the revised 2021 through 2022 Board of Education meeting calendar. Is there a motion to approve the revised 2021 through 2022 Board of Education meeting calendar as presented? We have a couple of changes here. One is we're, we're going to drop. Oh, it's not on here. We're going to drop the what was it? December 12th. December 13th, 13th, 13th is the original scheduled and yeah. we would move that to December 6th. We had a, a sixth meeting, the 13th meeting, they were both going to be small. We've consolidated those down into a single meeting on the 6th and we changed the location of the January 10th meeting to O'Neill Middle School and the location of the July 11th to O'Neill Middle School. So moved. discussion. Oh. <laughs> is there a discussion or is this there the... Discussion? There needs to be a motion. Oh, oh yeah, I, I have a motion. Sorry, I jumped out of myself. What is your motion? We have a motion. Second. Member Ellis had the motion. Second. Okay. Now any discussion? Yes. Can I? Uh, we had merged the December meetings. One of them was a workshop, and one of them was just a regular board meeting. Correct. Mm -hmm. Will we take the format of the workshop or the board meeting? It'll it be the format of the meeting, but it'll become the what would have been the workshop will be our spotlight. Because we still the have benefit of a workshop music. for the public is the two-way conversation with the board. I want to see if there's a way for us to retain that. Uh, I don't want there to be fewer opportunities to have two-way conversations with the board. Is there a way for us to do that? Um, yes, what, what I believe you could do as, lo as long as the full board gave direction is when um, Todd and Kevin Bardo give the facilities presentation, you could open that up to a public comment after that in the same way that we would do our workshop public comments just for that specifically mm -hmm. in the spirit of the workshop. I see. And then you would have a second public comment Almost like tonight, how you had two comments. The More only the difference is that right would there. certainly, um, yeah. it would be different than tonight because you're limited to three minutes in, in that I'm format. But, but during that, you could have a give and take. Um, so you could certainly do that if, if needed. I'd advocate, uh, I, I'm indifferent on whether we do one extended public comment or we do two of those. Uh, but I'd advocate for at least having a space where there is an opportunity for two-way dialogue. I agree, Color. I like yeah. that I idea. Like it. I like that idea. Uh, just to po out that? post out another option here for you on something that yes. we haven't done in a while, but we might now uh, feel a little bit more comfortable doing it. We haven't had an opportunity to do a meet and greet with the board, and there could be a potential opportunity to do that prior to the board meeting to allow for people to come in and have an open discussion with us. Obviously, that's not on, that's not on the record or, or, or broadcast, but it is an opportunity for, for the community to, to engage with us, which is something we've done in the past prior to a regular board meeting. Just a thought. Uh, I, I'm open to doing the other way as well, so. Not a bad idea. I tend Why don't we kick that out until one of the early uh, 2022 meetings? That's, that's our next meeting. No, no, I'm saying the kick out like the, the coffee with the board okay. until <laughs> I think you might have this discussion later. until like early 2022 and we just do both I mean like and do both but like like stagger them just so okay. we have the opportunity to hear from more people and, and plus so do a, 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 a second reception 
with a extended opportunity on the sixth. Yeah, and then, and then maybe like month? January or January tenth or February fourteenth, have a yeah. coffee with the board, and yeah. I think we'll be. Perfect. Um, oh, that's good. You know, like by that. that time we could be the our. I, I think like m maybe I'm uh, being a little bit um, optimistic. <laughs> I, I'm optimistic by then. Like maybe people are, by in December would might be a little bit antsy about coming out, but maybe by the by the time the holidays are over and uh -huh. and more, a lot of kids have been vaccinated, it might be easier for people to say, "Yeah, I'm ready to come out sure. and, and and rub elbows with with a bunch of strangers." <laughs> I think that's I, I I'd be in favor of waiting until 2022 to start to opening up those kinds of spaces. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any issues? Any issues? You don't have to have a call. reception of visitors. Yeah. Right. 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 I don't think so. Okay. We should be up there. Just, we always call the call. So yeah. we will go ahead and add that as a. We'll add a second reception of visitors since we have combined those meetings, and we'll do that as a, um, as a, as a dialogue with the board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Do we have to vote on both of those or just one all in one? No, we're just revising. We can just add that. Add it into there. Okay. Yeah, we can just add that onto the agenda. One vote. Yep. I, my move stands. Okay. <laughs> Alyssa, <laughs> please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the revised 2021 through 2022 Board of Education meeting calendar as presented. A couple of announcements. Monday, November 15th at 3.45 p.m. will be the district leadership team. Where are they meeting at? O'Neill. O'Neill. Uh, Tuesday, November 16th at 7 a.m. will be the policy committee. Where are you guys meeting? Good question. Don't know. Policy committee still to be determined. Yeah. Uh, TBD. Uh. Wednesday, November 17th at 3.45 p.m. will be the legislative committee meeting. And where are you guys meeting? Uh, that's at Longfellow. Okay. And then um, Monday, December 6th at 7 p.m. will be our next regularly, regular board meeting, and that will be at O'Neill Middle School. The board will now move into closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss litigation when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis of the finding shall be recorded and entered in the minutes of a closed meeting, 5 ILCS 120 to C11, and discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 2.06, that's 5 ILCS 122 C21. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet up at 9.55.